Email, Larry Bros, look at you. After what's, that, what's, that, what's the logo say? Well, we green away. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's no, but it's not signed by anyone, and my name's Bob Rock. Where did you get that? Was that recent? They had That's nice. I don't have it. We got to give it away. When did you get that, though? When did you get that? No. I can't tell. They don't have our size. They don't have our size. Maybe you can sew two of them together. Yeah. Uh, you're like, 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 Yes. I mean, I know we don't have enough stuff well, and, you know, and cranberry sauce for everybody at the adult table. One is here for a specific topic and the other is a council member. But you have to eat a cookie because I can't. Yes, that's the, <laughs> that's the cost. He likes it. He's not the one that sits in the back of the church, you know, last row. Uh, yeah. They should, they should pass a hat. <laughs> <laughs> Present. <laughs> Council Member Edens. Here. Council Member Farmer. Council Member McCune. Council Member Remy. Present. All right, good. All right, moving on to the second item of the agenda. We have the approval of the minutes for September 10th. Council Member Remy making a motion for approval. Is there a second? Council Member Bertolino. Do we have any uh, comments or uh, changes, Council Member Edens? Yep, it said that you called the meeting to order, but you were absent, so I think it needs to say um, our city administrator. And then there was one other typo. Um, the same. We it says pro tem everywhere, and then at one place it says pro temp. Oh. Um, it is the under three public participation in the red. It's the very first line, chair pro temp. I see it. For, yeah, everything else is. All right, so you got those two. Thanks for uh, you know, bringing those up there. Any others? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Yes. Abstain. So we have two abstentions. The minutes are approved. Probably got that. All right. Public participation. Okay, no uh, public participation. All right, so um, we're going to get into the agenda, but I did no notice Mr. Keitel is here and thought maybe we could give him the courtesy of taking care of the item that he's here so that this way, I think it's just the, uh, is it the one item or are you here from over there? I believe it's just the one. Yeah, oh, then, one so if uh, I could just get a motion to change the order of the agenda so that we can address the contractor bid for Route 100 meeting landscaping project first, uh, and then we'll resume the agenda. Motion by Council Member Edens, seconded by Council Member Bertolino. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? All right. We'll move. Uh, we'll just end the order here. So let's go to public works for action item number three, which is the contractor bid for Route 100 Media Landscape. So council members, um, of course, we discussed this um, item at the previous meeting in September. Um, the Department of Work with Ken Keitel to put together a refined um, project. As you recall, we have uh, budgeted monies this year to landscape the meeting. Route 100 from essentially West Glen Farm to Taylor Road. Um, we had, I believe, 200,000 budgeted for this year for that work. We advertised a project that Ken designed and 
bid uh, in, earlier in the year, um, which was a full landscaping from that from the, uh, the work that had been completed there at Westland Farms all the way through Taylor Road. Um, ultimately, uh, when that was advertised, we got four bidders for the project. The low bidder was Mayor Landscaping. The second low bidder was <coughs> Land Design. I wanted to point that out to you um, briefly um, this evening. Um, obviously, the project that we were, had previously recommended has not moved forward, so we went back to the drawing board and modified the project and scaled it back significantly um, and put together a project that can put out for public advertisements, er, that he advertised publicly and then we opened bids in about a month ago in September. Um, we opened the bids just before the meeting in September and we had, I want to correct what I may have stated at the prior meeting, we had actually two bidders on the project in September, but we deemed one of those two basically non-responsive. They did not provide a bid bond, um, so we deemed that we basically had one one bidder, and that's what I shared with you at the September meeting, was the bid from Land Design, which was the second low bidder on the previous project when we did it in January. So I told you in September we'd do a little more homework on this bid and try to bring it back with a, a stronger um, with more information to hopefully make a more educated decision on whether to move forward or not. Um, Ken is here tonight. He did have some conversations with the bidders. Um, I believe we had seven, bid, uh, seven contractors that received the plans. Is that not correct? That's correct. And um, Ken did try to follow up with those, those contractors to get a sense of why we only received basically two bids. Um, and I think in general, what you heard in large part was that they didn't provide bids because they were just too busy and they didn't feel like they could get the work done um, by the end of the year in large part. Uh, now there may have been, there may have been more to it than that with Mayor, the low bidder before. We're not quite sure. We didn't, we weren't able to touch base with them, I guess, at this point. Is that correct? Yeah, I had touch base with them before I left town uh, when the bid opening uh, came in and he indicated that he wasn't going to submit a bid and then when I got back in town found out that he hadn't and uh, I haven't, haven't been able to touch base with him since then. <clears throat> so we have one bid from Land Design which again was the second low bidder when we previously did the full project in January. Um, Ken contacted Land Design and has proposed making a couple changes to the project um, which would reduce the cost um, from the previous bid amount down um, to about just over $50,000, 52354 to be exact. And the two changes that we thought we could make that would reduce the cost kind of provided a, you might want to provide a little more detail on this, a Fleximat paver system. There's a median crossover on the project that you might be aware of, um, which is for emergency vehicles. And Ken had tried to incorporate that into the plans and provided a, a pave. We were going to install pavers essentially that provide a firm, stable surface for vehicles to cross over. Um, you checked with MoDOT and they will allow us to remove that. Yeah, that actually, uh, the first go around and even the second go around, was installed at the request of MoDOT. I mean, they had asked us to improve that crossover. Um, and then after this last um, uh, bid opening, I contacted MoDOT to make sure that it would be okay to pull that out of the project if you all deemed that you didn't want to do that. And he was reluctant, but he said that he wouldn't hold up the landscape project uh, if you all decided not to do the uh, flex map papers. So that's a significant savings right there. It's $20,000 could we could cut, we believe we can cut out of the project. So that was the one change. <clears throat> the second change was related to, and you may, you might want to explain this a little bit, was the, related to compliance with the prevailing wage requirement or, or what they perceived to be a requirement, is that right? Well, um, projects, landscape projects in, in Missouri here, uh, if they're over $75,000, um, uh, have to be prevailing wage. And um, 
the land design that submitted their bid was in slightly, as I recall, like 78,000, but that included prevailing wage. Um, but if you pulled the prevailing wage out, it dropped it below $75,000. So uh, we didn't really uh, have to have prevailing wage. So that's, I think that was a reduction of about, what, $4,000 or something, something like that. 5500 Yeah, $5,500. So I'm still, you know, substantial amount of money, but it, it brought us below the 75000 threshold. So that was just kind of right off the top. That didn't change any scope or anything like that. <clears throat> so there's those two items. Um, there's a third thing I wanted to mention to you, and I'm passing around a, uh, a uh, summary of um, the unit prices that have been bid on this project and the former bid in January. And what I'm trying to show you here um, on this copy that's in front of you what I've done is combine the two bids from January and September and um, compared land design September bid with their prices bid in January for land design and mayor. And these are the items that are consistent from the two bids. The projects weren't, weren't obviously identical, but there are some items that were identical. And so I'm showing you those items. And the, the idea here was to give you a sense of was this bid a good bid? Was it competitive? And I think I can say that based on this comparison. So the unit prices that Lane Design provided in their September bid are, are in fact, I believe they're in large part lower than what they did in January, um, for the most part. Obviously, the total is, is a little bit higher if you compare these. But I think it gives you a sense, at least in my mind, that it is a, it is a good bid. Um, something that I would feel, based on this, justified in saying it makes sense to move forward if we feel that the price is right. So I wanted to provide, that was the third, the third piece of information I wanted to provide to you. So we're, we're still having one bid, and I think the thought is, do you want to move forward with that bid? And if so, we can certainly. Councilmember I'd like to make a motion to accept this bid and put this on um, council for this Monday so that we can move forward to get this done this, this fall. Okay, is there a second for that motion by Councilmember Brost? Does that work, this motion, to put it on Monday's, this coming Monday's agenda? Um, our deadline to put the items on the agenda for Monday is tomorrow at noon, so we're assuming it's on the ticket to, yeah. Okay. Okay, so the motion is good then. Uh, so we have um, Council Member Bertolino and then Council Member Dickens. Um Two questions or not comments, really. The, um, the matting is actually independent of the landscaping, right? So we can actually do that at some future date if that's what the Council provides. So Mr. Keitel yeah. agrees. Or, or if we can get MoDOT. John, John will get MoDOT to pay for it later on. Speaking um, of more, can I ask a question? Did I, understand, did I understand you correctly to say that they wanted us to change that turnout, that emergency turnout? They wanted us to do something with that? That's the 20000 mm -hmm. What did they want us to do with it? Pave it with gold. I know what I'd like to do with it, but now I'm asking, what did they want us to do with it? It's mm -hmm. actually That's kind okay. of a, um, uh, a paver system. Uh, we're using some of it uh, to protect the inlets that are down the center, and it basically is kind of a concrete product on a, on a grid that lays down. So it actually would, I mean, to be honest, it would look a lot nicer and neater and cleaner um, because you don't have gravel all over the place. Um, but it basically was just to uh, provide a, a more all-weather um, crossover for that. Did they not put it there in the first place? That was before my time. I'm assuming that it was, well, yeah. The emergency vehicles required it, so I don't know who actually installed it. Uh, yeah, we're, we're not out. we're not going to move forward with that anyway at this point. Okay, yeah, so that's, we took it off. That's so good. Yeah. Councilmember Roberto Lee. Yes, uh, one else. other item, and that is on the uh, the prevailing wage requirement. Uh, Ken, am I correct in saying that this particular employer uh, does not pay a prevailing <coughs> wage, and therefore they if required, it was going to cost them in labor 
another fifty-five hundred dollars. Is that correct? No, sir. I mean, he he bid it as prevailing wage. They they always bid all the price. Their land design is a huge landscape contractor mm -hmm. in St. Louis, and he when I guess when he came down with the size of the project when he was putting the bids together. Uh, he was assuming that portions of the project were going to be prevailing wage, and like the crossover and the like. Uh, when when we actually pulled that out of it and it dropped it below the seventy-five thousand, he was saying, you know, he was fine with that also. It still I'm confused. It doesn't mean this number fifty-five hundred. Where did that number come from? That number is the added cost for if you bid the project prevailing wage. Um, There's a, it's an extra, I mean, because you're, you're basically, um, I guess, utilizing a different uh, trade to put, uh, like the crossover in. You'd be utilizing so, a different trade that okay. would require you. So the trades or the workers who we putting in the landscaping are already, you're saying already, paid at a prevailing rate? On the, I, I honestly couldn't tell you that. I'm, okay. I'm saying that what he, he was able to pull by, by not going with prevailing wage, able to pull 5,500 out of the whole project. So yes, I'm assuming that um, the project now will you know, not be, landscape doesn't have a real strong union and so uh, an awful lot of the landscape projects are not um, prevailing wage, even for what we do here for the city of yeah. Wild. So, so, so I think what, what I heard him say before is, is that if it's over 75,000, you have to go at the prevailing rate wage rate. Right. But when they did the original estimate, they had already assumed that we would be over that amount. And so therefore they build it at that Okay, so the 5500 is only that portion that we're not going to do, they're saying we're not, but that, that seems like we're double counting. If we're not going to do the $20,000 crossover flex matting, the that's got to be wage, Yeah, the prevailing wage rate that they use for landscape and the other products is obviously higher than if he's not bidding a prevailing wage. He, he has a different rate. I, I, my whole point, I'll shut up a minute. My whole point here, Joe, is that I don't think it's good for the, for the city to say that we have a contract in which we did not, we as a city, did not require our contractors to pay a prevailing wage. Yeah, that, that's my concern. <clears throat> so according to what I'm seeing in the bill that went into effect August 28th, um, there are prevailing wage rates uh, are not paid on public works projects with an accepted bid or estimated cost of 75000 or less. And so since uh, at the, what the cost is without the prevailing wage would have been seventy two. But I think right now that's a little bit relevant because we're down to, we're looking at 50, 50, we're looking at a project uh, cost of about, let me see here, 52354 <clears throat> so even if you were to recalculate uh, using prevailing wage rates with what's left behind, that is in the fifty-two thousand, uh, I imagine that definitely wouldn't get us over the seventy-five thousand. Yeah, I and yeah. I appreciate that. My, let's boil it down even. And I'm sorry for taking up your time, but it, it, it is an issue for me anyway. Let's get it down to brass tacks. Let's say I'm a laborer putting in the shrubs, yep. okay, and I am paid. $8.50, an hour, $10 an hour, I don't know what the rate is, but let's say it's $10 an hour, okay? Prevailing rate might be twelve fifty. okay? Am I going to be paid $10 $10 on this job, or am I going to be paid twelve fifty on this job per hour, okay? And what I'm hearing it's, them say is that they're going to pay $10 an hour. I think they have to pay over the minimum wage. Well, over minimum, but not prevailing. Right. Prevailing, and according to the state law, it says you don't have to... Uh, at seventy-five thousand. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. That the state legislature said that, but I'm saying as Wildwood, do we want to say to our constituents, when given the opportunity, we chose not to pay prevailing rates? <clears throat> and it's just, if it was just me, tell me to shut up. I will. I, 
I just have a question. So, uh, I have uh, Council Member Evans, and then I can come to you. Is it about this? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. If that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mine's different. So I guess it, my question, and I came in late, and I apologize to everybody, but I guess is, have we done this before? I mean, has this been a question or something that has posed the council I the committee before? I guess that's my question. <coughs> actually, what? For prevailing wage, have we had this discussion in some other projects before, and this has been a, called a question? Well, I think the bill went into effect August 28, 2018. So I, uh, it appears that it applies to public works projects. So that means that uh, I would have to ask uh, and Rick Brown knows that for it. And, and only that bill just increased the dollar amount. It's always been there, just increase the government. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, and that's what I was going to, you know, I've been doing what landscape projects out here since 2000. And whenever we do a pure landscape project, we've never put it out at a prevailing weight. All, all of our other projects we do, but the landscape, landscape project we do not. Window. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I have, that's why I was saying, I have a feeling that that 5,500 applied to the um, the work that was going to be done on the Fleximat, mm -hmm. and then when it dropped down below seventy five thousand, he pulled it out, and it probably was going to have his landscape contractors. I'm guessing here, uh, have his landscape people actually put the Fleximat in. That, that's what I'm that's assuming. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. Get there. All right, Councilor okay. Eden, you're up. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Is it ethical as to argue over $5,000 for a, a big wage difference on a city project? I totally get what you're saying. Yeah, I had a, I had a quick question on um, uh, the itemized bed sheet number two, dwarf burn, burning bush, three gallons. So when I wasn't here last month, I was in the Missouri Municipal League lectures, and there was information given from the Missouri Invasive Species Task Force, the Botanical Gardens, uh, Mo Prairie was a group, and one of the things they discussed besides honeysuckle were burning bushes um, affecting uh, under the sort of the tree canopy. Birds are dropping the seeds from landscaping, it's going into the forest. It doesn't slow down water at the correct rate, so it actually affects creek runoff, and then we're dealing with water issues in the creek task force. So I guess my question is, does the dwarf burning bush is that a different cultivar, or does it produce less seeds, or can we switch it out for something native? But this is in the middle of the road. This is in the middle of the highway. But it's, I mean, it's still, creek. no, but birds are dropping the seeds and feeding, and so, I mean, basically, if, how can we ask other subdivisions and landscapers not to put it in when we as a city put it in, right? Because if we put and in subdivisions, we want to kind of, get our subdivisions away from doing that. So if we're spending money on the city to do that with paid landscaping and putting invasive species in that can affect the ecosystem in the area, I just I just kind of flagged that plan as a concern simply because I had to hear about it for 20 minutes. <laughs> Is there something that's cost effective that we could? Well, it's uh, somewhat in, keep, in keeping with what the theme is out in Wattland. Right. And you have burning bush, um, all along the highway. And I get that it's cohesive, but mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily make it right. And I have, you know, I mean, you, you've obviously been to some seminar, but I have not seen any um, reports or anything that it's on an, inda or a, an invasive species list, at least to date. I'm looking such at- Such as Bradford Bear. Or okay, or, it's on the yeah. moinvasivespecies.org. Okay, and then that's good to know. Shaw Nature Reserve sponsored um, and I, I have some stuff from it too, but I can also hand you this too. So, I mean, I know it's cost effective. I know it matches everything else, but if if it wasn't invasive 10 years ago when other things were put in or five years ago and it is now, shouldn't we make the change sometime? I mean, I just don't. Well, the, the problem that you have is when you start trying to plant in an environment that is in the middle of a road that's uh, constantly receiving salt as well right. as other, uh, your your plant palette becomes pretty small. With carbonaceous, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that's just, just absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it is, you know, un, yeah, not unlike honeysuckle, uh, you know, yeah. which can survive just about anything. That's probably one of the reasons why uh, it's been overplanted. And right. I'm 
right. and I'll be the first to say that but by the same token I said we don't have a big list of plans that we can use out there that will be able to survive and I hate to have you come in and put right. uh, just because it's indigenous doesn't mean that it will be able to survive in that but there's non-indigenous that are not invasive though that is there's true. non-natives yeah. that are not invasive so I'm just wondering if there's just but when you start One going through the palette option. and right. you start listing the criteria, start listing that you, it has to be deer resistant, you start listing that it has to be uh, salt resistant, both spray and in the soil, then that list reduces down quite a bit. Right. I just, there's just got to be, and I'm not trying to be so really <clears throat> critical. I get that it's cohesive. It's just. It, it is a it is a problem. It's kind of like the equivalent of planting lots of honeysuckle. It's a survivor, but that I have a problem with that. Councilmember McHugh. Just to piggyback on what you were just saying, I, I get exactly what you're going mm -hmm. with this, and I appreciate that. But I think that what he's also saying is that we are limiting the scope of what we're doing. I guess I would just kind of call to the committee here are is everybody else concerned the way that you are compassionate about this issue and is it something that we need to push this again back and say okay we need this more for the research or is this something that we can maybe start kicking we've <coughs> been really kicking this a lot mm -hmm. and I think that we're it's just like we keep nitpicking this to a thing and I'm not saying that picking no, that's yeah. bad for what you're saying but again I just want to see what the consensus is if this is a concern that we need to do it or do we not because I just hate for you to just yeah. talk in the that question to uh, council members. Yes. So I would I would be willing to move forward with this if, if I could just show you what I've seen and maybe we can get another idea for the plant if you agree in work session before it's to council. Does that make sense? I'm fine with that. It's up to everybody here. So what you're asking is to move this forward, but while he's looking at <coughs> other options, right? So maybe what the, we could do is uh, move it forward, and and like you're saying in work session, if there yeah, is if a there's anything else, right? Of equal uh, cost that right. we could swap it out, and uh, and that would address the concern, and of course it would have to be something that blends in with the area there, so that you know it's. You know, appealing to it's the only way I can in good conscience vote for it and not hold up the process is that if he's just willing to explore that why we move it forward I'm okay with that which one is it again it's the dwarf burning bush okay. does the dwarf burning bush get paid for mailing reader maybe yeah. <laughs> but he's going to file suit and he doesn't want to be called a dwarf yeah I'm looking at that <laughs> <Mullen Basis. laughs> is that the site mm -hmm. it's one of them it's one of yeah, them it's also <laughs> they have a wind one, or wind there's, burning bush. There's so there's different varieties. Maybe there's different burning bush family. Uh, uh, you know, there, there's a wind uh, burning bush and there's a uh, dwarf wind burning bush. Uh, one, the dwarf gets about seven to ten foot tall, and the wind gets taller than that. There is a a uh, cultivar called uh, Rudy Hags, and I will check to see. If indeed that is a sterile yeah, um, that'd be good. Uh, cultivar, and that gets five feet tall. So, all right. So, um, with that, do we have any other comments here, um, Council Member Remy? It looks like your hand is up. <laughs> so, I'd like to amend my amendment to reflect the council member's uh, request. Okay. So, the maker of the motion is a second. Uh, you're good with that. Okay. All right. So we're going to I've got it. You've got it? All right. Is everyone clear on the motion? All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain? All right. The motion passes. Thank you. All right. We'll resume now back to the order of the agenda. So first item under administration is information number one, the review of city fees for services. Sam has an informational update on this one. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. Um, just looking at past agendas and some of the items that we have listed on there is not ready for action. Uh, but coinciding with a request from another municipality to get a, uh, a listing of all of our fees for services. So staff worked on putting that together and 
I figured I would share that with this group since it was a past agenda item. So my plan moving forward, unless there's any objection, is to take a deeper dive into some of these fees, watch the staff to see if they're reasonable, and certainly within the uh, Hancock Amendment requirements um, to see if there's an opportunity in the next several months, possibly by the end of this calendar year, um, to see if we need to make any updates or changes to those fees. And if so, we can bring the ordinance to the, to the committee and council probably in December that we potentially go into effect in January. It's a pretty aggressive schedule and the timeline, so it might not be until next year, uh, after the calendar year. At that point, we probably propose it for maybe 2021, but then moving forward every couple of years, it's a good idea just to review these things and see how, how we're comparing with other municipalities but also just whether we're keeping up with the, the time required by staff. So. Yeah, this was an item on the uh, Edmund Public Works agenda maybe about a year ago, and that was exactly mm -hmm. the intent that once the city administrator position was filled that okay. this would be a test, so it's great timing. And if I recall, there were some fees there that hadn't been updated in quite some time. So that uh, that's a good exercise. And given the, the timing, uh, yeah, it might make sense to try to see perhaps those fees that may be received uh, more often or, uh, or you know higher impact and try to tackle those. So I've got uh, two hands up here. Uh, I've got Councilmember Bertolino, Councilmember McCune. Uh, okay, Councilmember Bertolino. Very quickly, Sam, is that traffic generation assessment fee, that 1265, is that, didn't we up that just recently or is that the upped number? Rip, you know? Where are you seeing that? Uh, the, under the T's, on traffic generator, the TG. Oh, Remember the we added the yes. third garage? Kind of thing? Yes. Uh -huh. um, that is, that was recently, I think, brought to council because that was, a, there was a separate committee that looked at it. had this. to do with the, the way we count the number of parking spaces. We were always counting two, two, but now we're going to three oh, or three. four. They have four garages. That was right. the change that we. So we didn't change the amount, we just, just changed the way in which we counted. Okay, thank you, that's, that's it. All right, Councilman McHugh. Uh, the false alarm charge, I, we question with a residential versus business. Are we just gonna keep it as one lump? Because I think other cities divide that out. If, I, if Sam could look at that differently, I'd like to see if that can change. Mm -hmm. um, and then, do we collect those funds or does it go back to St. Louis County since they're the ones responding? How is that appropriate? My guess is it's going back to Metro West or you know, another organization since we typically don't respond. I can, I can so is this police and fire or, or is there a designation for it? Yeah, it could be both. Okay. Mm -hmm. I did just yeah. businesses have asked that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Great. That's about the I guess the, the franchise fee. It says 5% of gross revenue. What is that? What, what's gross revenue? It's a calculation based upon actual revenue received <coughs> and taxes. So you'll see that typically like on a phone bill when you get your sales taxes. That is the quote unquote franchise. Franchise fees don't technically exist anymore. They're license taxes. Okay. Um, but that's what that is. All right, so thanks for the update on that. We'll look for more updates going forward uh, with this. All right, so we're gonna keep going. So administration B for action items, the first one is the review of the council attendance policy. This came up at the council meeting, the first meeting of the month of September of city council to defer to this committee here. Um, so uh, Sam, do you wanna kick it off? Yeah, I just, I, I took a shot, did some research. Uh, what our charter and our ordinances require, and they currently don't have any sort of requirement to, to track attendance. Um, so I just presented a couple of options, asked some municipalities uh, through the city manager's listserv uh, what their policies were on the council attendance. And a lot of the cities that track attendance track it because their charter or their ordinance that says if a council member misses a certain percentage or a certain number of meetings, consecutively over the course of a year, um, then they are potentially subject to removal from office. Uh, since we don't have that provision uh, in our regulations, we aren't technically, you know, we don't have to do that, but if it is a matter of the council wants to bring more policy for 
just wanted to provide you with some sample language from some other municipalities um, and uh, pose some questions to, to this group to consider if, if this body wanted to move forward with adopting the policy. Okay. Councilman McHugh, I again, Councilman Burley and so I think that I'm the one that kind of brought this up just from the attendance of showing up late. Um, and I think that it was important because it is published in the Wildwood Gazette. People use it for different reasons to see if you're active on these committees because we don't get paid for this. And I think that it should stretch across all different bodies that we're called to serve, not just council meetings, but also these committee meetings. I think that it's been important that we all show the attendance records and they're done for a reason. So I'm in favor of adopting a policy. I'd like to talk this through in a work session that makes more sense to everybody. I think Creep Core has it right. You know, you don't show up for five consecutive meetings of something that doesn't show that you have that interest or should you be replaced by somebody that can represent at that point in time. Um, I don't know how that works with a council meeting itself, if you can be removed and then we replace. I don't know about that, but I'm more worried about this type of body um, that we have, and it just holds everybody accountable to what our expectations are from the city. So, so, and, and as we get into the discussion, mm -hmm. I think we want to make sure we're very clear. Mm -hmm. There is the city council meetings, yes. uh, city council work session, then there are the standing committee meetings, mm -hmm. and then there's, uh, I think, PMZ, uh, what do we consider mm -hmm. that? That's a different classification, right? Uh, so, so I think we need to be clear as to which ones we're talking about. Because if I recall, there is one set of meetings, perhaps it's the PNZ, where I think it does state in there that if you miss half the meetings, there is some kind of provision in there about the rule of law. The further attorneys explain that. I think that's the only place. They went right? through that as part of their bylaws. The issue with any just verbatim, you know, per se removal based on number is, uh, for the Planning and Zoning Commission at least, there's a statutory procedure for That's removal. Right. Removal can only be for cause after a hearing. Uh, so it's basically an impeachment procedure. Mm -hmm. right. That's a statutory committee. That's the word. Right. That's right. Right. So yeah. we would probably not want to touch that because that has its own set of rules. Um, but I think we would want to make sure we're clear as to whether we're talking these meetings here council meetings both. Sure, and I think that you need to subdivide that as being present for the entire meeting or if you're late. Like, where's the time limit that you're actually marked absent that you are considered absent in that meeting? Right. So we had talked, you know, one and two minutes. We weren't, <laughs> we weren't like in that consensus. But I guess, Sam, did you find out if there was a different policy for attending late, like showing up late that would be? No, I, I didn't ask that specific question. So again, I presented to this body to see what you guys think that the tardy policy should be on top of the regular attendance. So let's see, Councilmember Bertolino, then I have Councilmember Eaton, let's see if you've got yeah. any thoughts on that. Um, it, I appreciate those who are concerned about this. I am, I'm, not, uh, I'm not in favor of an attendance policy for following meetings. I think our founders uh, had the right idea in having a 16-member council and then giving us eight members on each of the standing committees that's a lot of folks. You look around, at, you know, like our friends up the street here in, in Manchester, like they have, what, four council members or so on. If, if you start having absences on that small of a group, you've got a problem. I don't think we have that. From a number standpoint, I don't think we have a problem. And correct me if I'm wrong, John, but I think the mayor at any time can change a, the composition of a standing committee. Is that true? I have to look at the ordinance on that. I believe he appoints the standing committee. I don't know if he can just change it, but that's an ordinance. And you can change that at any time as a, as a council. Because well, the mayor does add to um, mm -hmm. the, the, the committees as, as members come on or come off and so on. And I think, I'm kind of saying, I guess, I think we're self-regulated or it can be self-regulated when it comes to standing committees. So if Joe goes to the mayor and says, hey, Bernalino's missed the last five meetings, I don't want him on my committee anymore. I think the mayor has the the right, I mean, check it, John, has the right to say, I'm going to reconfigure that, that committee and put somebody else on there. But the last point is I think only the constituents, the, the, our ward constituents, have the right to remove us, or and that's their ultimate goal. Their ultimate uh, responsibility is if they don't like what they see in the Gazette in terms of attendance of their council member, 
they can vote us out of office at the next election or the next time we come up or so on. Uh, of course, if we have ethical issues and so on, those those are a little bit handled differently. But I, I think we're self-regulating. I, I would oppose a, a formal policy. Okay. I have Council Member Edens and Remy. The, the one thing that I, I flagged in my mind is I, I understand why it's an issue if you miss a cluster together. But typically with health emergencies or family emergencies, you might miss a cluster together. Uh, for example, we have, we've had a family friend that fell on the ice one year, had severe concussions and missed work for two months um, and was hospitalized for a long time. But using that as an example, they maybe miss four in a row and then miss nothing the rest of the year. Meanwhile, somebody can um, be a serial misser and miss you know, six or eight meetings and not qualify for that because they miss once a month. So I guess just thinking realistically about how things happen in life, if, if you miss less but clustered, that's a different level of pen penalty. It's actually more severe than missing six or eight spread out. I don't know that that, I don't know how that makes sense. And may, maybe it does. I'm just thinking of scenarios that I have known with friends and family. And um, that's just a concern. So a couple things. So um, <clears throat> I do think that um, we should, uh, in roll call, have a 10 minute grace period. Um, that I think could be uh, something that's fine. Um, I oppose an attendance policy, and I'll tell you why. And I'll give you both an existential uh, re response and a pragmatic response. And the pragmatic is probably more related to Councilmember Edens. Um, I guess I take a, a more global approach to what city council represents to me. And it's not just about attending meetings, it's being present every day of the week for your constituents, and it doesn't boil down to just attending that meeting. And so, um, and I'm saying this, I have not missed a meeting at all since elected. I'll miss my first meeting next Tuesday. Um, so I actually think that I agree with Councilmember Bertolino. I don't think we need a policy. I don't think this is a problem. I don't think we should make it a problem. I think we should continue on as we're doing. And if this becomes a problem where some folks are missing more meetings, then, then we can address that, I think, in a different manner. I don't need a policy, though, to do that. And, and with that, yeah. Um, <clears throat> got some comments, and then I'm going to circle back with you. Uh, my, my comments are, uh, there are two, two pieces to this. There's the, are you present or not? And then there's, I think, the lateness part of it. But you're still there. Um, I favor the easy answer is I favor do nothing uh, at this point. The transparency is there in the Gazette that dictates to the public when you're there, when you're not there. Um, if you are late, uh, I think that I'm, o I'm okay with just putting the time there. If you show up late, you know, if you show up, so if it was a six o'clock meeting, you show up at 6.17, well then it's there. And if you show up at 8.30, it's going to be there as well, and then the public will see that. If you are not there at all during the time the meeting starts to the point when it's adjourned, then I think you're absent from the meeting. Um, the transparency is there. Uh, we've had situations. I remember in my first year we had a council member uh, who was heading out of state, uh, I think due to a sick aunt, and you know that's something that I think was outside of his control for several months. Um, and that can happen to any of us, uh, whether it's our personal medical emergency or a uh, loved one, friend, or family. Um, so uh, I think it's then up to the public to decide and to judge, you know, how much service we give to that community. So that's my opinion. Councilmember McCune, and then I'll come back to Councilmember Evans. So I think that all the input from all of you is helpful from the stance of what I was taking initially. I think this all derived from the tardiness um, mm -hmm. question because it was inconsistent on how it was marked and how it was treated and where there was an X in the Gazette that showed I was absent, I was truly wasn't absent. So that does reflect on when you rerun for elections too. Mm -hmm. That's a bad mark on us that I can't get mm -hmm. changed. Unfortunately, I can say I was there. Yeah. I've seen that used. Um, the one thing that I do want to bring up though that I am concerned with and I have seen in the last thing before I took counsel, and this is one of the reasons, is that a past council member that was in my ward I understand that the mayor appoints to the committees, but that person did not show up to these committee regularly. So the constituents, even though we had an interested council member that wanted to attend and could, but this other person couldn't because of work, didn't have a say in it, the mayor appointed it, 
Now the constituents are not getting the right representation. So the mayor has the power to not appoint anybody, which I feel is unfair. So when you look at it that, there's a power struggle there. And I think that if that other person wants to step down and can't fulfill that role, they should be able to appoint the next council member because there's two of us. That doesn't happen now. The mayor says that he can just leave it vacant. I, I don't That's approve. a different topic. Though. Sure, but that's still point. within the purview of putting a policy if this person can't show, yeah. then they're removed and the policy can say that the other constituent can take over, or the other council member or representative can take that seat. Because the constituents need to be represented and the mayor shouldn't have the power to make this vacant or not. So it goes around policy if you're attending or you're not. So that, that's one thing I, I think that's my main point there for committees. Mm -hmm. There's a problem. So if, if everybody's following the rules and you guys don't see that there's a problem, there's no reason not to have this as a fallback policy. If everybody's perfect and everything's clean, we don't have an issue. But we have a policy to fall back on for that one person or that one incident that it does occur. Without anything, we're all sitting here going, what do we do? We got a two year term or one year and we have to go this full year and this guy never wants to show up. Or gal, I won't. <laughs> so there, that's my two cents on that matter, and yeah. open it back up. So, uh, Council Member Edens, and then I did see some other hands. Council Member Remy and Bernal. Okay. I agree. There's an issue on committees. I don't know what the solution is. I don't know if the way these are worded necessarily makes sense. But I'd be interested in continuing that discussion. Um, in terms of the late. I would almost go up even to 15 minutes, 10 is fine if that's what consens consensus is. And my thought was I figure, okay, most meetings are two and a half hours. So 15 minutes is actually 10%, meaning you're there for 90% of the meeting. So that's how I got to 15, but if you guys want 10, that's 5%, that's, that's fine too. We also need a designation um, for uh, absences that are, are related to the city. For example, the last Creek Task Force meeting, I was double booked for historic preservation and this. I can only make one committee meeting, I can only be at one roll call, but it counted as an absence against me. So if we could come up with something in our policy, either it's a non-applicable or, you know, a in the building, but, but not a full absence because it's, it's going to show up and I did my job and I was here and I, I understand exactly why council member Remy said that he didn't think it was appropriate when we were both absent because we were at the municipal league but at the same time it wasn't another work event we were actually there in our official capacity as council members um, with our name plaques on representing the city so that's a little different I, I wish that wouldn't have counted as an absence either, but it did. So I, I would like us to address that in the future, especially being double booked because I was here. <laughs> you know, that's it. Thanks. Uh, council Member Remy. I don't have a problem with you guys going to Municipal League at all. No, I don't. I don't. Oh, okay. No, no, no. No, okay. no, no. I just meant <clears throat> it as a part of entering it into the minutes officially. So I would keep the, I agree. Mm -hmm. I, think that's, I think that's reasonable yeah. to do exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I would keep this categorical. Um, I think so. If we were to use a 15 minute period after that, if you are at the meeting from the, up in your seat within the first 15 minutes, you're present for the whole meeting. I don't need to report out minutes of five minutes, four minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes late. There's no point to that. You're either present at the meeting or you're not. That they're one or that's all I think that's important. Um, back to the, the committees. I understand what you're saying. Um, I don't agree with what you're saying. And I'll tell you why. Because I know lots of people that could sit in their city council role and attend their two council meetings a month and their subcommittee meeting, and it ends there. And they're on council. And I could foresee that there would be other people who are active for 25 days a month and for some reason don't have a missed subcommittee meeting for some reason. I don't know why, but I'm just saying. Um, I'm not sure that uh, I agree with uh, penalizing those people. If they're doing active things related to their city council position and or that subcommittee by which they're part of, everything is not governed by just simply a vote. Frankly, most of our votes are near majority anyway. So I don't know necessarily that the relevance is always as important. I don't favor a policy. I agree with, I, I think that this, this is not a problem. Let's not make it a problem. 
Um, but I do believe that the tardiness of the issue should be dealt with. I just keep it categorical. That's what Bernalino. Yeah. Um, I, I got <clears throat> two issues here that we, and we started out with the, with the attendance thing and we kind of got to the just tardiness and then the other issue of replacement of people on the committees and I, I tend to uh, agree with Dr. Remian. But, um, and if need be, I would make a motion though that, uh, later on that um, tardiness, that we say that 15 minutes, if you're there in your seat 15 minutes after roll call, you're still considered as there for the whole meeting and there's no annotations in place beyond that, then you would be asked if you're mm -hmm. there but late. Okay, that, I think that's probably fair. That mm -hmm. would, yeah, that would sound fair. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the second issue on replacement, I, this is a question, John. Um, <clears throat> um, Normally, the mayor, a mayor, uh, divides the council up and says, okay, from this ward, this one's going to go on this standing committee, and that one's going to go on that standing committee. And since we have three standing committees, they, they divides them up. Uh, but is that, uh, quote, an ordinance? Or has that just been a standard practice that that one goes on one, one goes on the other? Is that, is, is that I guess that's a question to you, John. Has that just been practice, or is there really an ordinance that, that talks to that? Let me, if I could, if I could answer your first question first, because I do have an answer to that now. Uh, the mayor does not have the authority to move people around from committee to committee once the appointment is made. But this actually might answer a lot of the questions that are being raised or ideas that are being raised. What the charter provides is that the mayor has the authority with the consent of the council to appoint members to committees. Those members of the committees can also be removed by the mayor with the consent of the council or by two-thirds of the members of the council. So you have, as a council, by two-thirds the authority to remove someone from a committee. That creates a vacancy on the committee and the mayor has an obligation then to appoint a replacement for that committee. Does he have to do the replacement though or can he leave it vacant? Um, the, the City Cup or the Charter provides that the mayor no later than 30 days following the vacancy occurring with the advice and consent of the majority of the members of the City Council shall appoint a replacement to fill the position for an un unexpired term. Now, whether that apply, I, I'd have to look a little bit closer to see if that's a requirement for council committees, uh, but I think that's it would be consistent with the intent of it to do so. But whether it's technically required or not, I think is a question. Uh, and then to your question about the committees themselves. The city code establishes the standing committees and the manner of appointment it states that um, each of the three councils standing committees shall elect each other, uh, they shall consist of no less than eight members of the city council and that's simply what it says. Yep. So it does not specify that it has to be one from each one. That's, that's practice, is it? 20 years that's mm -hmm. been the practice. That's been the practice, but it's not required. It's not required. It's required. Hmm. But I think uh, what I would ask is we separate topics because what we have here is specific okay. to just attendance. Right? Okay. So if that's something separate, you know, separate discussion would happen. Um, all right, count, uh, I guess Councilman Reed, it's your Can I make a motion that the staff provide mm -hmm. recommendations for an established practice on attendance? when council members are either double booked by the city or serving in their official capacity at a city related event, maybe related is not the right word. City sponsored? City, bus city uh, business. Uh, official city business. Official city business. Yeah. So that you can, we can, you can get back to us and we can kind of move yeah, forward there on are, that. There are, yeah, I think there are, we probably do need clarity on that because, yeah. you know, sometimes someone could even get invited as a council person to a subdivision meeting that happens to fall on the same night as a council meeting. So now, you know, is that considered city business or not? I don't know, but someone could dispute that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, you know, going to lead it's meetings. Yeah. Um, your example's great. You know, I think one night, I think it was like double, you know, double book yes, or several yeah. books. Yeah. Um, so it might be helpful. Maybe we don't have to have the answer right now right. tonight, but you know, uh, let's take our time. And right, and it actually finish. happened. I know with Councilmember Gregnani, you're on the Creek Task Force with us, and you were here for the Pond Sewer meeting. 
So if you, you were out for more than 15 minutes, you shouldn't be counted absent because you were doing your job in another room and then came into that other committee late just because you took the time to talk with your constituents and literally walked next door. So if he does that in the first 15 minutes, he counts for both. Yeah. Um, that, that that's that true. That that's yeah, true. That's good. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I think uh, you know, just some sort some of official recommendation <coughs> is what I'm making the motion for. Yeah, and, and I would uh, I'd ask too is you know for, uh, what did, we, did you say you wanted to have like as far as the lateness in that? No, well, we already got the oh, there's already a motion on the floor. No, I no, there's not. No, there was I didn't a motion. Me. So okay, we have a motion. Mm -hmm that you started here. Well, I, I, I want a recommendation from staff, but I think we could probably move forward and vote as a committee right now on the 15 minutes, okay. right? So make them separate, so let's, Got it. yeah. So you're making a motion, is there a second? Council Member Farmer, are you raising your hand for a second? Sure. Is everyone clear on the motion? Yes. No, let's, let's, yeah. and that's, that's why I get the wordy. Some, I need some clarification. Yeah, yeah. let's, uh, so Carl, could you read the motion? I'm sorry, this, Carl. That's all right. The, what I have from Councilmember Edens is um, requesting staff recommendation on potential attendance policy on the occasion of member attendance at another official city business. Um, where, the, where is the time? Different time issue. Yeah, we're talking about 15 issue. minutes. No, no, we're doing this one no, first. This, oh, first. this is the motion on the floor. And then we'll do the other one right after. Would you move? I did, but you know, uh -huh. he doesn't see me waving. Okay. I don't know so, what a giant man So this motion, are you clear? Are you clear, Carl? So this is specific only to coming yeah. up with some recommendations as far as how do we handle when you are... Um, In two meetings, supposed to be a two meetings meeting. at once. Conflicting yeah. meetings. Yeah. Right? How will the attendance be reflected on those meetings? Yes. All right. Right, you have her motion. It's on the motion. It's on the motion. Yes. So in the motion, what your comment was was I agree about the subdivision meetings. How do you, d d you know, separate these two things out? I think it's going to get too muddy. So I think that double booking at a city function, like you mm -hmm. said, yes, we have two standing committees that are the same night. Yeah. Like right now, town town center. If both of us were assigned, one right. is absent right. and one. I agree with that one. The other with the outside of the capacity of what this body is I don't agree with and that's why the staff should make the recommendation and staff can even write back you know no sub subdivision meetings don't count right. you know so you still want to see that yes in addition right. yes okay. for example the municipal league of st. Louis sure we have someone who's here and therefore if there's a meeting yeah. the municipal league does that mean that they're counted as absent? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Another okay. I'm I agree about the same question. So I just <clears> want <throat> staff okay. to come up with a recommendation. I, I'm fair now. So, okay. Councilmember Rand. Speaking on the motion, sir. Yes. <laughs> okay. Please do speak. So, um, I think that, you, I, first of all, I don't disagree with your motion. I think it's fantastic. I'm speaking about the spirit of the motion. I think that this body should also, after we approve this motion, hopefully, really carefully look at we have a lot of meetings yeah. yeah there may be too many meetings for this city or maybe the frequency of the meetings may need to be recalibrated you know we've actually talked about this previously and i've talked to a number of city staff about this issue and frankly what you're bringing up is that there just may be too many more you know maybe we should look at this um, and and figure out how often do we need to all meet in this committee, this committee, this committee, this committee, this committee, this committee, this committee. Why can't we do some work outside of the committees and then reconvene for maybe less frequent motion? And then we, these issues, although I agree with the motion, may be less of a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would just want to, this body, because this is the group that would figure that part out in, con in, in conjunction with the city employees, we should think about this. I'm not going to add it to the motion right now. Was there a second to the motion? So, um, I, uh, Carla, do we have a second? I have a second. Yes, okay. you second. Yeah. that's right. I'm sorry. So, so anyone second. else with the comment? Well, technically, can I second it? Because I guess I'm technically 46 not minutes, you've <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's right. Technically, how does that work? Oh, yeah. yeah. How does that work? If you comment in 16 minutes after the 
yeah. 46 minutes. I counted. Money's going to come around and go home. That's the MBO yeah. practices. Right? It, it, it's hard. <laughs> but he should still be allowed to participate even if he's merged now, correct? Do we need to establish that in the 15 minute policy that you're allowed as, to participate? As it currently stands, and John and Jessica and I have had conversations about just how to mark somebody if they arrive late. We're not marking anybody in absent. We're marking currently one time. Yeah. So the minutes for this meeting. Next month will reflect, you know, that council member McKean arrived at 642, council member Farmer arrived at 716. Oh, so I think the concern was so how, does it, no. how does it appear on the Gazette, though? Right, right that was the question. The question. Well, so you can do this, though. So if you're after the 15 minute grace period, then you can start the count clock if you want to do it that I would, way. I would suggest put the clock in because then we yeah. should give someone but, credit. If but the clock starts at 645, it doesn't right. start at 630. Starts at 6:45, so you get a 15-minute grace. So we can get it from downtown. The minutes always have to reflect the accurate time that you right. have to reflect who's present. Right. 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 And I mark the time of arrival, and they're on the minutes. Always. However, personally, when I provide the information for the Gazette, if you came to the meeting, you came to the meeting. Regardless of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. So, so, so that might be in Councilmember McKean's case, uh, is that mistakenly marked her as absent. So that might that address your concern that it shouldn't occur what happened sure, in your situation. Yeah, on the minutes now, was anybody absent last month? I was. Joe, I Joe, and, or the, and and Joe, Lee, Joe wasn't appointed. Well, yeah, I guess it did. Yeah. So but yeah, I, I just want to make sure that it, if, when it, it comes to the attendance and when it's recorded off of this, that it shows that you're present and not it, when you're late, so, when you're present. Mind so you, do they have that. small in parentheses arrival at. Okay. So we, I think this is still a good motion because okay. it's a problem that we went into and it's not fair to mark someone when they can't technically be in this place right. if they're in another meeting. Right. I agree. Uh, and let's let's get this motion off the floor here. So if, uh, <coughs> any other comments? No. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? <coughs> All right, so that motion uh, passes and we'll get a recommendation of how to handle when you have to on yourself yes um, but regarding the uh, the item where it's how it's reflected I, I think the city administrators provide some good clarity that you know that may have been an anomaly what happened in your situation but the Gazette will mark you as present if you showed up late uh, so therefore they may not need any action for that unless you want to change that how it appears in the Gazette well, that's what I'm saying. I, I do. I, I, I think that if you arrive between 6.30 and 6.45, you're present. If from 6.45 on you arrive, then that's when those are the late minutes, if you will. That's how I would reflect it. You wouldn't reflect 6.42. 6.32. No. No. No way. So therefore, um, as long as you arrive in the first 15 minutes, it shows as an asterisk, and then if you arrive at 16 minutes or later, it would show your time that you arrived. I don't think the asterisk. Or do you, today it will show the asterisk, so there's no difference That's whether you arrive at 10 minutes or 40 minutes after right, the hour. Right, 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 right. No, I, no difference. I would not put the time. I would just say arrived 17 minutes late. Just do it that way. 6.45, if it was meeting at 6.30, and you arrive at 6.58, you are 13 minutes late. Uh, I would still so include the grace period. So you're here at 6.42. I've already emailed the Gazette already. I guess, right. so, but am I present or am so I So you're not? present at 6.42, but Councilman Farmer would actually show a time. And I wouldn't show a time. And I'm okay. You would not. I'm okay. Because according to Councilmember Remy, he said the first Correct. 15 minutes you're I'm, you're, I'm in with that one. Period. That's what I'm saying. That's you're in the grace so period. So as long as you can be here every meeting, 15 minutes, up to 15 minutes, mm -hmm. you're always marked with a star. That's what I You do. get a star. If uh, if you feel like Joe, unfortunately, he had a conflict. He told me. Um, he said he was going to be late. He uh, he will. It would just show late. X number of minutes. So that's what we're talking about. Carla, how is this from a logistics? Okay, thing? I have a question. Sorry, I'm not on the committee, but I do on how this would work because there are votes taken in that period of time. Yeah. And the reason for reflecting time arrival often has to do with votes that were taken prior and who was in attendance during that vote. 
So, if, so I guess your concern is the 15 minutes may not sound good because it might mislead. Uh, if if Councilmember McKim came in at what time did you come in? 6:42. So you came in at 6:42. If we had a vote, we did minutes. We did the minutes uh -huh. at 6:30. You're not reflected in the minutes. She will. She'll be absent. It's not reflected in the vote count. Right. Yeah. It, it will be. She'll be absent. It's like when people get up to go to the bathroom and people vote and they say Bertolino, Bertolino, and he's not here. Hey. 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 <laughs> <laughs> We're going to the old guy again, aren't you? <laughs> you hear that, John? But I agree, that happens in council. It's the dwarf. Place. So how's that treated? I don't know. What's that? Well, when you're in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, it just, you, you're just not shown as voting, uh, right? It just shows you, it puts you, what, under uh, not present or something? Well, like on council, it usually has the specific A's and nays, right. and here it's a voice vote taken voice with vote. unanimous. Right, so it doesn't even get into the Unless show. we add the accepting yeah. council member so-and-so. But but even under the sorry, I mean, it's, am I right? You're, you're going good. Keep okay. Going. So even thoughts. in those circumstances, though, the eight, the eyes and, and the nays, let's say, so in the meeting, if there are 16 people and two people happen to go up to go to the bathroom, um, not the women's bathroom because that still hasn't been fixed. I'll bring it up to council in two weeks. Yeah. Um, but if if there's 16 people and there's two at the bathroom, it'll just say 14 votes eyes. So it is reflected. Those people are still absent from voting, so they're not included in the total complement at the end. No, it just, I think it just says voice vote. Uh, it just passes by voice vote. No, but there's majority. sometimes when people, I'm talking about when we do, when she does roll call votes. Those are specific. Correct. Those are specific. Specifically right, right. Who is? But we seldom do roll call so votes. Seldom, but it committee. could be requested, yeah. right? and that could be done. Um, so my point is that it's already reflected in the, the count, the numbers, if you will. If we find that there are, at this meeting, let's just say, seven people arriving all at 644, we couldn't even have a vote, and that would be refl that would be a different story. But we're, it's not like we're, we're running into this problem that frequently. If McCoon and Remy just get to the meeting <laughs> from downtown. Yeah, I mean, again, I think we heard that this was a one-off situation yeah. that occurred, so you want to leave it as it is today, or do you feel that there's a problem? I okay. need to change it. Well, I like we just talked in a circle. Maybe now we yeah, should I, just do nothing. Can I just ask a question? Because I'm buffer. new. <laughs> Are you allowed to ask questions? I don't know. If I don't know if I'm here or not, I'm still learning. I'm the new guy card. So here's my okay. This is a, a, a You question. only get a few of these. So I know. Sure you mm -hmm. So <laughs> if. <laughs> number one, I've only done this a few times, but I really don't know that this is an actual problem. So I'm a little confused why we are having such a long discourse <laughs> about it. But number two, Welcome to council. <laughs> number two, I mean, I am, I think that the way that these agendas are laid out is really pretty good. So couldn't we just try our very best as a city in the first 15 minutes to, if we're going to have to vote on stuff, do the things that we're just going to be like, yeah, with, and then we don't have to really worry all that much about it if somebody has to go to the bathroom or something. I mean, I, my thing is, if I need to, all I would like to be able to the ability to do is explain if somebody's concerned that I'm at this meeting a half an hour late, one of my constituents or whatever, and they ask me, I could say, yeah, I was at my daughter's volleyball practice. And they'll be like, okay. Yeah. The minutes are always show that. So I, I just, I, I mean, I don't know that it is a real huge issue. I think that the more you get into it, the, the deeper of a hole it's going to become. So if I, I'm going to use my card. I, I would say kind of leave it as is. My, my take is something, but... I'm making a motion, actually. You're going to make a motion? Yeah, I actually think that it, I actually want, really would like the 15-minute buffer. I think it's important. I second it. Wait a minute. Wasn't that your... Nope, my motion's already gone. No. There's a new one on the floor. Dupl duplicate meetings, mm -hmm. conflicting meetings mm -hmm. on the schedule. Yeah. The 15. yeah. So, so you're making a motion, and we have a second, and this you want to apply the 15-minute rule. I do. Yep. Um, all right. Any discussion on the 15 minutes? Council member Ian, council okay, member Okay, real quick. Okay, so the only thing I disagreed with is in terms of when the clock started. So that if you came in, you know, at 6.30, you're actually 30 minutes late, you're not 15 minutes late. I don't, I don't think if you come in at 6.30, it should reflect that you're 15 minutes late. I know that we have a buffer, but that's, that's getting really weird with the timing. When the actual live stream will reflect that you're, you're not present for the first, first 30 minutes. So I think that 
we need to be really careful about how we present the time that people are late after the 15 minutes. It's like you just, if you're there, if you're not there in the first 15 minutes, it's not reported at all. If you come 16 minutes later, it's reported as 16 minutes late. Yeah. We don't get creative with the minutes. That's uh, my and, only and I'll reflect that as an amendment. That's fine with me. I think you have to be, you have to know, you know, I think every attempt made to start a meeting right on right. time, but there may be meetings that may run a couple minutes, you know, 32 mm -hmm. it starts at. So I think you want to make sure it's from the start, 15 minutes from, from the start, the start yeah. of the meeting. Totally agree with it. Totally yep. um, so, so to, is that major the second day you're Absolutely. on board? Yeah, because it doesn't reflect the first 15 minutes. It's only after that point that it would reflect the time point. That's right. No problem. I'm going with it. Good. Yep. And Councilmember Bros. So, if it's within 15 minutes of the start of the meeting, mm -hmm. there's no mention of, you're not really considered late. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you're absent for the vote that may take place, it's just going to, if you're absent for the vote. Um, if it's beyond 15 minutes, then the minutes is going to reflect the exact time you arrive? The, mm -hmm. the, uh, the minutes late to the meeting. It's just going to say late. It's not 16 minutes. It says arrived at. Yeah. That's fine. Well, I mean, if you I want mean, to do, you can do it. You can do that if you'd like to do it arrived at six. Say the meeting's at six, it like and so. you say it's six thirty three. That's totally like fine because it won't reflect the people that are let's, there. Let's first make sure it is in the motion. If that's easiest, clear. that's fine. Because okay. the council so will want to ask, and they may have questions. That's totally reasonable in my book. If everybody else, yeah. So maker and the second, are you okay with saying arrived with the actual time? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. And then this so important gazette, will that actually state a, a time? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if they come 20 minutes late, it what does the six, gazette say? We'll say arrived 6.50 in well, the gazette. I'm wondering. No, Carl is saying it doesn't. So they're just taxes, I believe. Well, well, that's, I believe, why you want the motion, because the minutes already reflect when you arrive. So this is all about what's in the gazette. Can I ask Sam, because you and I had talked about that, about the inconsistencies with other people that were showing present or not present, and when they arrived late and when they weren't. That was the question because it was treated differently. And I think when you looked at, you compared the Gazette for when people showed up and when they didn't, it was reflected that they were there, but they were really late. But it was marked down as an X for the Gazette. So that was the problem that I ran into, not just my issue, but it was an inconsistency that showed that if you came in an hour late, Joe, yeah. you were marked absent in the Gazette, but you were present for the last two hours of the meeting when it continued. And it did, the minutes did reflect, arrived at whatever, I'm not picking on you in general, but there was inconsistency with just not you, with everybody right, right. Um, going back in time. So that was my concern is that we need to come up with some consistency because that Gazette really reflects something could be negative on you even though you participated in the last two hours well i think that's why you uh are making the motion here so that there is class she seconded it for the minute seconded it but the question he said was the x on the gazette yeah. Yeah. I got fix. we have three columns on the gazette present absent late column anything after 15 minute grace period you put a check in the late column done is there enough room in the gazette it's very tight. I'm good with it. Well, okay. I, uh, I, we have a motion. Are we voting? I mean, yes. No yes. yes. Um, yeah. And, and, uh, Sorry. That means you'll be marked absent. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, did you leave the room? Because I mean, if you left the room, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. If you're late, you can put an L. L. I mean, that, instead of putting the time, is the X when you're present or not there? It only says present or not. And okay, so then we just add a footnote. And if someone looks yeah. down and everything is one way and then there's an L, then you don't need three columns. They're just noted as late. Yeah. And it could be 16 minutes late or 60 minutes late. I think the Gazette, actually, the way it works, is I'm just gonna look the it column up. is blank, and when you're absent, I believe it has the letter A, I think, in there, or some kind of indication. Yeah, A, B. A, B. That's right. So now we would have an L. So, so just have that in one column. That'd be great. Be so the, instead of A, B, it's an L. All right. So maybe Perfect. to clarify the motion, maybe we just say that um, uh, if you, uh, we'll put it in proper terms, but I'm just going to say, if you arrive 15 minutes past the start of the meeting, you will be reflected as an L for that column in the Gazette. 
Is that? 16 means 16 minutes. 16 minutes or later. Yeah. yeah. Central time. All right. So maker and second, is that what you're intending to do? Ken, what do you think? Ken? I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Ken, you okay with that? Okay with that, sir. All right, we're good? Mm -hmm. All right. Is everyone clear on it? 16 minutes or late, you should mark with a letter out like a report card. Oh, I have the official phone. The timer. Clock. Oh, okay. yes. Just That's in right. case. Have a cookie. Okay. All right, then. We should vote on it. Let's clap vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? All right. Thank you. A motion passes. We beat that one up. Yeah, we did. All right. Well, we figured it out. All right, number two on the administration for action item, we have it. Uh, this is a carryover item that we've had. It's the RFQ for the Government Affairs Consultant. So just, uh, do you want me to keep jerking over? So uh, we had for some time a, consul uh, a consultant, this sort of AKA lobbyist, and this was around the time of the pool tax. And uh, it was determined a while back that we would uh, cease working with the lobbyists at that time. The discussion at the time was that we should consider having one on our list more as an ad hoc, ready to call when we were needed. And so this came up at the same council meeting that we talked about the previous item there. So the question I think for this group over here is going to be is, do we want to look into starting up that process to identify potential lobbyists. And if we go back in time, about four years ago, there was actually, I think, a committee, subcommittee, I think, formed that evaluated lobbyists and there was you know, a process of inviting them in and asking them questions. That was done, now that was more of a contractual basis, so we may want to just have a short list and you know if needed or we can take it to the point where we have one and can already have the terms agreed on and say look what we need you we'll call you but you know that's up to this committee so again this is just revisiting the the topic of whether or not we want to have a, a, a lobbyist or government affairs consultant ready to go can you find that's most of it did we vote on anything yeah okay yes no. you're at so, now. Council yeah. thank you so I think that came up, I believe you brought up at council, so we were all present at that meeting. And I think it's helpful, thank you for the background about the floor of the committee, but I think we have so many committees that are going on, and with Sam being new, and he, this is not his first rodeo for a city, I think that it would be helpful if we let him vet that, mm -hmm. and let him describe what the city's facing as he's coming into this, and we're gonna do a lobbyist, if, based on the conversations that we have. I think he has enough knowledge to figure that piece out personally. Okay. Um, Council member Eats. Agreed. Yep. My my one thing that I would ask you to, to keep in, in mind, Mr. Anselm, is I think the approach would be to find out who is advocating actually for rural areas for rural internet access as opposed to using one that normally handles cities in St. Louis County. Um, just as a completely different approach. Um, and I, I honestly think what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to band together with groups of population that exist even an hour from us or farther. And so I would just ask you to kind of look into that. Who does the, the, the areas that have the highest gaps in internet, who does their work for them? And can we get on board? Uh, and I'll, I'll comment on, I'll put my name on the mm -hmm. list. Um, you know, I think depending on the topic, so if it's rural internet, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. There may be one that's more suited and has more background and knowledge and understanding about rural internet. Mm -hmm. If we need to look at uh, pool tax, now we, at yeah. the time, the reason why, the one of the reasons that was brought up was is that we would just work with the municipal league since they already had one, <coughs> and that's why we felt we didn't need to pursue it. So we could take continue this for this ad hoc per type of situation approach. And if that's the case in the immediate need, I'm trying to recall what was the immediate need. Roll internet. Roll internet. Then um, I think to your point, uh, leaving it to the city administrator to do some research and see which ones specialize in internet um, and how they can help us. Mm -hmm. And then um, 
then based on those conversations, come back and let us know if we need to move forward with engaging them for some service. What do you think? Yeah, I, I'm thinking through from a process perspective, and I asked a few neighbors about how they handle the lobbying process as well. And five of our neighbors actually joined together and retained a lobbyist that just monitors bills that go mm -hmm. through the legislature, mm -hmm. and they give those cities an update. That costs those cities $750 a month. That's really well in monitoring service, and I believe these cities will offer a similar service to all of those representatives. So um, I haven't seen that email come through since I started here in Wildwood, but that would be, in my mind, a duplication or yeah, we don't want unnecessary that. service. Now, if there yes. is a request from council to you know, make a motion from the body to direct staff to look for or that, that's the direction I would need is a motion from the council that's approved. I don't want to just have one council member come and say, do some research on this particular issue. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would feel more comfortable moving forward either engaging job services or, or, or staff time if we have a, a, a vote from council to say, let's, let's go and look at what those opportunities are. And then we can do the research and bring back and say, we've got three of the firms that specialize in the area that here and there. You know, to your first point, yes, the municipal league does send out monthly an email. Mm -hmm. It is buried in there that says, here are all the bills that are being talked about, and they also provide a summary in there. So they can sometimes will provide what the municipal league's opinion is on those items, but the support done. So maybe from the monitoring perspective, <clears throat> you know, we may continue to do that or, you know, eliminate that duplication. But council mm -hmm. member, even to them, so, so what I'm thinking, it's not monitoring. What I'm looking for is a, is a lobbying firm and lobbyist that feels comfortable writing draft legislation because, let's be honest, a lot of times lobbyists write the bills and they bring them in. That's how legislators oftentimes get something in front of them and, and that's what they work off as a document. I am looking for somebody to walk in, pound the pavement, go to the rural internet committees and essentially either tack our bill on to another one, even if it's amended on the floor, or to push something through committee that gives us a, a sort of a niche carve out. In other words, uh, yes, state money can only go to rural areas of 10,000 population or less, except for Wildwood. I am looking for a piece of legislation that gives us an exemption and allows us to be funded. I don't care, I mean, the monitoring is not worth duplicating but that's the type of service I want is somebody that can line up the votes and walk in with a bill. So uh, council member McCune and then Remy. So I, I agree with I think that's the purpose of what we're trying to do and let Sam figure that piece out but paying specifically for that reason and I think that we did that where council member Ignati was bringing up the fact that there was this funds that we were that we and you can comment, you know, on what it, that we were entitled or we were subject to some of these fundings to help us with that initiative. We didn't get it because we didn't classify for right. I'm saying change the rules. Yeah, yeah. So if we can do that, I think that's the objective of what we really want to task you. So if you need a motion to move forward with seeking out a lobbyist or lobbyist firm, however, I will make that motion to have staff. Um, particular you or however you designate to use the resources necessary for you to seek, seek out a rural internet specialist, the lobbyist, to write, to assist us in writing legislation um, to help us get that classification. Did I miss anything with what we wrote? No. Okay. Perfect. Council member Remy and then I'll have a comment. I understand the sentiment. I, I would not agree with that for either, either one of you. Let me tell you why. Up to 97% of the United States is considered rural by the census, uh, and that actually about one third of all Americans don't have access to, to the appropriate uh, uh, speeds for internet. <clears throat> I'd rather not spend money on lobbyists in the state of Missouri when this is a major problem nationally. I'd rather spend money on people that actually um, have IT expertise that actually could be consulted specifically for the city to address this problem with a lot more novel ideas in 2019 that could address this, then that includes DSMB, that includes uh, using wave technology um, and a whole list of other things. I don't think a lobbyist is going to actually affect us in the end. I think we'd rather find ways to actually get the internet physically put into place here, even if it means uh, startup companies come here and there's a cost to do that up front. 
I don't think a lobbyist is going to provide any, any benefit for us whatsoever. <clears throat> you're not going to change the rules to be able to affect one third of, uh, of the United States, nor are you going to affect the rules in the state of Missouri that are going to uh, obligate some way to get funds specifically to this location. It's just not going to happen. Can I uh, put you on the list? Be pragmatic and realistic. I just want to throw in my comments there. So um, I think that we need to make sure that we have alignment, agreement with what is the approach with how we're going to tackle this rural internet issue. And I would mm -hmm. like to get the direction from I believe the Rural Internet Access Committee would be the body to say, this is where we want to put all our eggs in one basket to say, we want to go down the path that this is going to solve this problem. And I'm using the example of classifying the rural internet and that's that will fix it. I don't know if that's the best answer. I leave that to that committee mm -hmm. to make that determination because they've spent a lot of time and volunteered that time. Mm -hmm. But if they were to come and say, look, Joe, this is what's going to make it work is we need this to happen and we can have that first conversation with those local representatives who we already have relationships with. And if they're on board, then the lobbyist helps because then that helps get the message to the rest of the House and the Senate. If we can't, we don't know yet if we can get our local people on board, I think a lobbyist at this point might be too early. And so that's where I would like to, you know, be able to say we move forward once we know that is the, the go forward plan. And, and that may be it, I don't know, but I would, I would just like to get that direction. Because if we're going down 10 different paths, uh, we're, we're splitting up all our energy and our resources, and you know, that may not be the best way. So that's my opinion. Councilmember Eden's Europe. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I guess my concern is we've already paid for consultants that haven't brought in any of these novel ideas. So even if these novel ideas have, exist, they're, if we got the best consultant available, that still doesn't help us bring them here. And so I. I have seen pork barrel happen, and I have seen exclusions made, um, and it's only pork barrel right when it's not your own city. And so I'm not saying that this is going to give us $2 million in funding, I'm saying it's going to help, I'm hoping that this would help reclassify us to even qualify for funding. You know, we don't even qualify for rural cooperatives. So there are, there are, other, there are other avenues, and, and things, honestly, they don't move quickly in the legislature. I mean, it may not even happen the first year. But it could, but again, it depends on if we can get an alliance with other rural individuals, it depends on the committee heads, but I, I, have, I have seen these kind of things happen. But, but that doesn't mean it will align, so I, I, I'm just not seeing the novel ideas come in with the consultants, so I don't know how, how we, even if we get a novel idea, which is great, it'd still be nice to qualify for some of that state funding to use towards exactly what you're saying. It's almost like we need both at once. Yeah. Yes, I, I don't disagree that it's okay to do things in tandem. Um, I'm, I'm just, I don't know that I would want to spend a lot of money on a lobbyist at this point to do that. I think that there's opportunities for us to partner with other perhaps. Um, so there, there are a lot of novel ideas. Perhaps those people haven't been brought to the table for many reasons. People have worked hard on this issue in the city. Right. And that doesn't discount the hard work that they've done. Um, but partnerships with other cooperatives, local universities. We've got a world-class university that's just down the street uh, why I'm late for work every day, who actually has a fantastic computer science department. Um, in fact, we should partner with them and see if they would be willing to offer some expertise in this area because they are at the, cu the cutting edge of the current technology wave and they partner also with entrepreneurs and with businesses with a number of different things. I don't think we've ever done that. I think that would be a good way to approach this. They also have um, um, interactions with government relations and lobbyists as well for, at the university for that reason. But only for their own issues. Uh, no, the, no, when they do things with that are entrepreneurial, that are in com combination with the university, actually they, they do. Um, but you I mean we we can I don't I just don't you know I've seen the effect of I don't know that lobbying is going to work when at the federal level we've been lobbying for rural internet for 20 plus years and it hasn't been necessarily effective. Yeah, I think and uh, and again that's where I say we have this rural internet access committee. It's their job. And if 
they see Agreed. this function, right. then it would be probably up to us to help solve the problem. Yeah. But you know, they they have to be the ones that are doing that research and agreement, and, and they might need to hear those ideas and suggestions. I'm not going to use her. I've got that council that member Greg right. Nanny. Uh, I just want to provide some information. We're looking at you have three issues that you're really discussing here. One is a lobbyist, which is separate and distinct. Whatever that lobbyist can do. Then you've got the issue of whether the state will help you, and you've got the issue of whether the federal government will help you. The state will not help you because the state's rules, the, the, the tag that was put on the money that was given to them by the federal government is controlled by the federal government's regulations. That's why they can't get grant money for the internet because the money came from the federal government and they told the state what the state can spend the money on and what they can't. So lobbying the state's not gonna do you any good because their hands are tied. So that, that's a waste of time. Lobbying the federal government is a big deal. It's, it's going to be very expensive, and it takes some special nuances to be able to do that. And I don't think we have the resources to do that at this point. But I would make a suggestion regarding lobbyists. I think that we probably ought to have a communication with somebody that we can trust. And I, I'll give you a, a, a tip here to the city administrator, uh, Sam. Have you ever heard of United for Missouri? I think so. Okay. Uh, 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 Jim Lemke, who was former state senator, is one of the members of that. And Carl, I can't think of Carl's last name. Bearding. Huh? Bearding. Yeah, there you go. Those guys run United for Missouri, and they do a lot of lobbying work for Missouri issues. I think it would be well worth the time to put a delegation of some of us, you perhaps yourself, and a few of us together to talk to them. And, and maybe if they want to, you know, if they want a fee or of some kind to up front to talk to us, it would be a one-time deal to get information from them about what they know about the business with the internet and whether or not they can or cannot help us with that particular aspect. I'm sure they have heard all this stuff that we're talking about. So we need to know from people who know about lobbying what it is that we can and cannot do without making assumptions that we can't support. That's basically all I got to say. There is about four million in state money that didn't come from the I understand, federal government. I understand it was, there's actually more than right. that. But but the but the bottom line is we have can't control it. Right. I've got Councilmember Gross and then McCune and Councilmember oh, okay. Go ahead, Councilmember Gross. I would say I mean we should look at anything and everything <coughs> and you know technology as well as lobbying and I I don't even like this, uh, if there's a lobbying or an outfit that could facilitate our discussions in Jeff City or in Washington, one, I don't even know if there's one out there, but I think it'd be worth the time to find out. And because right now, I mean, we're, we're searching. I mean, there's, uh, I mean $50 million will help. But other than that, we've got to find solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I mean, Ken, I agree with what you're saying that there's a lot of great technology out there, but I don't think it hurts to to keep all avenues open. No, I think I think the uh, thing is, the obvious is going to say, "What do you want me to do?" And we need to be able to answer that question. Is it do you want me to get you money? Do you want me to change the law? And I don't know if we know that answer. So that's where I say that the committee that's designated to come up with the solution needs to be coming to us saying this is what we need from lobbyists. Because otherwise the lobbyists are just gonna go out there, waste our money, and they're just gonna be talking to people and come back with basically what the committee is having to do, which is I think it's I think it's changed along in money. Well that's that's all of it. Yeah. We just need that clarity if that's what it is. All right. Council member McHugh, So I'd like to amend my motion that's on the floor <coughs> to what uh, Councilmember Gregnani had suggested. I think that maybe running to, but maybe having that committee or have a couple of selected staff and have him on this committee to approach the two gentlemen from the United uh, for Missouri just to have an understanding of what that does define what do we tell a lobbyist they have knowledge in this i think that i think that this body here has enough information that we do need to maybe run down this path to find out what we can and can't do I, so i'd like to make a motion to approve that part remove what i've said previous let's go to this route first and see where it takes us so 
So um, you're making a motion or are you, mod you modify I'm it? I'm a let me ask you what's the better way to do it. How about you withdraw your motion and we'll just start with uh, if the mayor and second are in agreement. We didn't we'll have a second, with. so I can just withdraw. Okay. So I can withdraw and then I, then I would like to follow up with the new motion. Carl, are you following me? Sorry. Is to, however you want to word it, is to allow staff along with selective council members, like council member Greg Natty or whoever wants to be on it or Rose says it's rural internet, um, to approach the United for Missouri uh, people if there's a small fee that's included to allow them to research this a little bit further to see what that looks like for the city. So you're just asking staff to research about approaching United. And, and then giving them the authority to engage with them uh, based on what you said. If there's a model, if, if there's a fee that is included to get them engaged, I think that we should just. So United, they, are they a lobbyist? Is that what uh, he knows they, they are. About. They are a lobby group. They actually have the, the two people that we mentioned uh, are, are the principals, but there are they have a network of folks that lobby in the state of Missouri for issues in the state of Missouri. And we need to talk. We need to ask them what is it that you could do, if anything. Because if they say you know this is an impossible task, then there's no sense of going any further. Okay, so you're making that motion. Um, I need to check if there's a second and then we can Well kind of I, I may want to amend it based on a question. So my 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 concern is I don't know that we should just approach United for Missouri. Because there's a lot of there are other lobbying firms and then there's other issue advocacy groups. And so that may only be one piece of the puzzle, but we may want to talk to other rural internet advocacy groups and then see if they have recommendations for lobbyists. I would just say, generally, just have staff do the research, determine who the you know the groups are that you want to talk to, rather than us telling you you have to talk to United for Missouri. I'd rather you see who's available and who you want to talk to. If that's okay, can I amend okay. that? Okay, because so, so I think I think that's too narrow. That's fine. I think it's just too narrow, and we may want to talk to five groups. So leave it open ended, but yes. include at least yes. the United for Missouri in the list there. Yes. So your motion, and you initially made it. I just did want to get clarity on that. You said something about including some council members. I think that what you said is that several of us that need to, along with staff, yeah, may be would. included in those meetings. So I didn't want it to be staff specific, as my first motion was. The second one, if Council Member Greg Natty wants to be part of that discussion with staff. I think I, we should open up to the council members that are interested in it. I think Mr. Gross would be interested because that's his ward and that's one of the big problems. Uh, yeah, so is six. I think that's and what two. I was going to say because otherwise. So let it be fun. selective and not not required. But if he wants to attend, it's not just staff. So do you want to just? Well, I would think two. Council Member Bolton. And, yeah, right, uh, and I said six too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Council Member Jordan, maybe because she's part sure. of it. And I think that that's. It, 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 to, to, to us, rural internet. Just to answer, just to answer, uh, Lauren, I think that any group, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be United for Missouri. I happen to know them. These guys serve in the state legislature, so they understand how the state works. Right. I think they can maybe even direct us if they can't do it. They may be able to direct us to somebody who can. So you've got contacts with United for Missouri. I can try to, yeah, I can try to get a hold you of know, Jim Lemke. I know Jim. I worked in this campaign. Number of years ago. Oh, you were okay. So, um, you know, maybe you know, I, I, I don't want to make it more complicated for you because then you know you might. Mm -hmm. Should we should we allow the staff some flexibility of maybe have the yeah. conversation and then Absolutely. report back? You know, yeah. Just so that you yeah, don't have to. Yeah, we don't that, need to be included. Because otherwise, no, if they're no, but I just want the options before I didn't Nothing say. Nothing personal, but I suspect Sam knows more about what the hell's going on than we do. Okay. So I think you. But I'm also not going to engage anybody. Right. So, so I think currently you're, you're having a conversation at this point. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that is that your motion? Then? Yes. So I want to make sure that, that the motion that is on the paper it matches then where we are here. So it's a motion to have the city administrator and uh, staff um, have conversations to identify potential um, government affairs consultants or lobbyists. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And advocacy groups, because there's two types of lobbying events. Anybody you can join an advocacy group lobby. for free. So, so the maker of the motion, you're good with that? Yes, sir. And then we have second. a second, a second by Council Member Evans. Do we have any other comments? Council Member Evans? Yes. 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 Council
Councilmember Redding. No, I'm actually okay. I my I was actually going to comment about the budget stuff because I wasn't on board with the budget idea, but Mr. Ansem yes. happily yeah. corrected that so that there's yeah. no budgetary. Yeah, and we're not authorizing that at this point. Right. It's more Good. just preliminary conversation. Also, we need to be cognizant of the amount of time he's got to put into yes, it. Sir. So, um, all right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstain? All right, the motion passes. All right, next item on the agenda, we have uh, number three, the proposed email use policy. And this item here, uh, uh, city administrator um, had sent that email to solicit your feedback and your comments. So uh, I know that uh, this was initially and we put together by our city attorney, it was a draft. So um, I probably want to just get an update on you know, reflect everything you've heard or if there's still some work. And I think the ultimate action is we're going to continue to work through this. It may, it may require additional work, additional comments, or if we are going to feel like we are ready to take the next step. So I'll let you both comment on Yeah, that. so I'll begin again. Uh, the last meeting, uh, council members asked uh, for any comments on the policy of the city attorney committee that we sent to me. And I compiled those, uh, shared them with John, and some of the, the red line changes that you see in the attached documentation. But then at the very end of that, um, he included the comments um, that were made by council members as well as his thoughts on those. So we just keep up for conversation. Okay, council member Remy, Kim, Eden, Bernalina. This is a great job, actually. So can I just take you to a couple comments? I'm overall, if that's okay. Um, second page. Um, where it says um, fundraising purposes include but are not limited to direct or indirect solicitation of funds, pledges, or other types of contribution for other than official business. It's yeah. It was a recommendation I received. Uh, I had questions about it too because okay. I'm not sure how you would have. The only official business of fund would be payment for services. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, that's the only, that's how I'm interpreting that. Okay, because that's, that's, it's really unclear to me, because as you say, I mean, I don't think that there's fundraising attached to the job, so. Okay, so I don't know if there's a better way to clarify that. Second page, uh, third page, excuse me, subscribed emails. Um, I would love to consider city officials must notify and, um, uh, must motive notify and receive consent from individuals who subscribe to mass communications by subscribed emails. I think that purpose of the word consent is important um, because just notification is one-sided, but consent is, is bi-directional. And I think that that consent is, I think, what makes me feel more comfortable. You want positive consent versus negative consent. Correct. So they have to uh, provide right, Correct. some form of record. My only comment would be, and again, I, I'm open to amendment if it's unclear, but in the definition of subscribed emails, we state that an email sent to individuals, individuals who have taken a willful action right. to subscribe to a city official official's email. Yeah. So the idea is someone has to actively seek to be part of that email. Yeah. Um, but, so, but we can put consent. Yeah. My only fear is that uh, let's say the city or 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 Lauren Edens or somebody gets uh, gets someone to subscribe and then she gives me all those names and things that did not consent to giving perhaps. Right. I think then that okay. would be defined as. Not being subscribed. Okay. Be unsubscribed. Okay. As long as that's clear that that's not. And if we, I'm not opposed to making it clear. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. And then number seven, email forwarding. Email forwarding is prohibited. Um, that's fantastic. I just don't know if we need to maybe include this. Includes forwarding emails via third-party companies, including things such as Mailchimp or some other companies, because um, that would be that's also considered forwarding. And I want to make sure that we're not that city officials, not talking about city employees, but city officials are not using third-party software to also um, release information. So, um, so email forwarding. So there's two ways that this could be um, thought about. So one could be I could just take all of my email and just forward it to my Gmail account, right? That didn't work out for some people in the federal government too well when I was there, um, but some people didn't have to follow all those rules. Um, and I don't have a secure server at my house, so I'm not doing that. But two is you could also email forward to your a third party company to then, then send out mass emails to everybody that's on the list. And to me, that would be also prohibited. That, that's what I would also want to recommend, that you're not using city email to use things like MailChimp or 
or blue or other, other groups that do this. And I think that that needs to be clearly delineated. Um, and also, I would say that transfer is another thing that I didn't see in here, which is um, obtaining, so if Councilmember Edens receives um, uh, subscri subscribers for her newsletter, she can't transfer those names over to a personal um, account and then use those uh, uh, email addresses for other purposes, say fundraising or political reasons. I don't think that that necessarily delineates us here. And I would really like to create that policy because I don't want, if uh, many people subscribe, subscribe to my newsletter, um, and then when campaign time comes around, I transfer all of their emails over to my Gmail account and then send mass emails through a third party. I think that that breaks the consent process and breaks the trust of our citizens. The newsletter's private. So how do you regulate private newsletters? It's not. Right, no, no I'm, I'm not talking about the newsletter. I'm talking about the, the folks that give their emails to be sent. So let's say I was having a, a Ward 3 newsletter and people subscribe to that. And I'm setting it from my city email, well within the purview, using it appropriately, folks are consenting to this, okay? What I would hate to happen would be if I were to decide that, well, I'm running for a campaign, but since I can't do that through my city email, I'm gonna take all those emails of folks that have already provided those to me and then move it to a third party like Gmail. I think that breaks the trust and I'm not interested in that. So I would like to make sure that, that this language is in here. Okay. If you consent to receive city-only information, that's what you're consenting to. You're not consenting to transfer. Okay, I'm following you. Then. Does that make sense? I, yeah, I'm yeah. saying clarity. Then. Unless, unless folks decide that there's a way to check a box to say I'm allowing my email to be transferred, and I really don't want to do that. I understand what you're saying. I might want to look at the Constitution and the sunshine law implications of having that as a mm -hmm. policy. Uh, my initial reaction is that it might be problematic, but I want to take the time to review it to make sure. But we could create our own policy. Well, the policy pertains to the use of the city email itself. Right. Now, in terms Are you talking of about protected information? Yes, I understand. Okay. Because okay. getting that information technically. It's public record. It's a public record. Right. Right. But that doesn't mean, just because it's public record, doesn't mean that we can't create our own rules of how public record is maintained on city council. The issue is not so much that, if you, if, even if as a city council member, you make a request for a public record, you're entitled to that public record just like anybody else. Sure. And how you use that public record after that, you really can't regulate. Yeah. Uh, and that's where it becomes an issue. Because when you send out that email, to you for fundraising purposes, mm -hmm. you're no longer doing it as a council member, you're doing it as right. in your private candidate capacity that the city really has no role in. But, but the only caveat to that is um, it may be public record, but if I'm sending a city newsletter to 900 people, um, folks could get that information through public record, but they'd actually have to submit a, a broad request for separate, because there's no way to get, there's not just one way to get all 900 emails from a, a Sunshine request. It would have to be each of those 900 emails to get that. Does that make sense? I'm not sure I'm following. So, um, so if I were to send out, a, a, so if I send out a, a newsletter to everyone in this room, um, and let's say everybody here's a private citizen except for me, um, Ms. Edens can't see Mr. Farmer's email address. Mr. Farmer can't see Mr. Garitano's information. All of that is actually restricted to the way that you send out your newsletter. So individually, he receives it, she receives it, he receives it. For you to obtain their information as a public record outside of what the city acquires, you would have to actually submit your sunshine request for each of these emailings, not so, one in mass. So you, well, At least that's what was explained to me when I contacted the MEC for this. No, we're talking about from, even from the city. From the city. Yeah, for a sunshine request. Okay. I mean, it, obviously it all depends on how the data is stored and yeah. whether or not the data can be combined through some program uh, to create uh, a single document or not. Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that. I would assume that if you're create, creating groups and emails to send out mass emails from the city, that group's going to be stored somewhere sure. uh, on the city servers and you can print off that group. Uh, I know when I create groups, like when I email the city council, it's a group that I've created yep. in my outlook. 
Uh, and I can probably access that and it'll have everybody in list of Which it's a program you have, it's in the, within the program. You can't sunshine uh, request a program, that's the issue. No, that's correct, but you yeah. can get, if the information is there mm -hmm. and there's a way to put it on a single, we have to provide it. Mm -hmm. That's, and again, we are, I mean, this issue kind of goes back to an issue that we discussed earlier that I was, not that I wasn't directed, I was not directed to do it, I wasn't directed not to do it, is the issue of going through the Sunshine Law analysis of how far can we go in protecting emails. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, a gray area I can, uh, that I'd want to research before advising everyone on. Okay, those are all that I had for this. All right, that's what we do here next. Yes, so the only thing that I had a question was is, well, first let me skip ahead so it comes backwards. So in the definition on page two, a city official um, means the mayor and city member of the city of Wildwood. Mm -hmm. The question I come back to is on the front page when we talk about city email means the city electronic mail for anybody that has the at citywildwood.com. The question comes in is the city marshal has that address or that's a concern if the city marshal wants to start doing a newsletter and that so they're not defined in this and they're assigned that type of an email so i think that those people need to be restricted as well because he is uh, appointed by the mayor so i don't know how to define that but i think that should be brought into this as well i received another comment about that the original direction i was provided was to create one for the mayor and the council and that's what this is now if we want to expand the scope of that i'm happy to do that uh, but without direction from the body and it, sure. itself doing that i wasn't sure. ready to do it but if the body wants us to do it we can do that but you had made comment that city staff has their own email policy that right. will regulate to them i'm just worried about the you guys have what you have i'm just worried about like the city marshal or whoever else would have this email that that they fall under the same rules that we do because they need a policy because they wouldn't be under the city staff policy the city marshal may right this is the just an example city marshal would yes mm -hmm. under what he's an employee of the city, city. policy city. Yeah. Right. Yeah, this is only for elected officials. Right. so he would be contract so anybody else that we can think of that would have this would fall under the city staff's email policy cool. is that correct look at section 11.3 of the city charter it defines yeah. who's an official of the city and that's everybody who's on board commission council whatever yeah my recollection and i'd have to go back to the employee policies and procedures manual but my recollection is the only person exempted from that policy is the mayor of council or elected officials okay that was my only well, big no. broad question that i just want to make sure that we included and nobody's left out so that's not another avenue that you know hey can you do this for me or something just in the future not saying that anybody would um, and then the second thing that I had was under five, um, subscribe emails. I know that we talked about the mass communication and what uh, Mr. Remy had brought up, but why couldn't we just disclaim, do we have a privacy policy current, currently for the city? I believe that there is one on the city's website, but it does make clear that under certain circumstances, the sanction law may apply. Okay, so that then that would just be the moot point. That was my question about maybe referencing that, but you know, when it I guess applies to that, that was my other concern. That's all I have. The other things were kind of answered on the summary, so thank you for that. Okay, I've got Councilman Reagan, so. Okay. Um, this is, I've just got a couple of things that I thought maybe could potentially be grammatical, but I'm not an expert in legal language. Under campaign purposes, uh, section one with solicitation of political support. Would it be helpful if there was a comma in there somewhere between either after ballot issue or or a vote comma? Maybe not. Okay, the next page, um, under fundraising purposes, the red line says for other than official business. Would it be better than other than for official business or for anything other than official business? Okay, could you repeat yes. what section you were just now? Sorry, sorry. Um, I skipped to fundraising purposes, okay. and I thought the underlying part in red just was kind of odd. It says for other than official business. I would have said other than for official business or for anything other than official business, but maybe it doesn't need to be changed. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I think one of the questions is whether that language is necessary at all, and I'm, I'm okay. kind of leaning towards the just original scratch it. Of getting right there. I agree. 
Okay, and then I, I don't know if it's necessary, but I think I found two double spaces as well. Farther down? Do you need to know or no? Uh, I'm happy to do it. Okay. You can do it online, I'll find all you want to do it. Okay. Um, so now I just really quickly want to talk about the mass communication. I'm just a little concerned about how this applies. So in the last meeting, we tasked ourselves as a committee with contacting trustees about um, the, the ash borers. So what I'm thinking of is, you know, if I, if I do this on email, it is a substantially identical content form letter. Now I would do it by subdivision. Now that's four to five, four to three people per email. So after five subdivisions, I'm already at 25 people. So now do I qualify as a mass communication? And if I do qualify as a mass communication, am I either one, technically prohibited, or two, do I have to have a disclaimer? Because if it's a mass communication, don't they have to opt in? Okay, well then how do, how do we contact our trustees without hamstringing ourselves? See, how do I put a disclaimer that you opted into this mass communication when they're only going to see a letter addressed to two other people or three other people? It just, it just doesn't, and I can't come up with how to fix it. I just think that, that I just found a loophole that could make it hard for us to do our job and somehow we need to address letters to trustees that are of similar content that may be sent out three people at a time, four people at a time. And if I just have to make a disclaimer, <coughs> that's okay. But they didn't opt in for that specific email on ash borers. And it doesn't really help if Dawn does half of them and I do half of them because I'd be copied on it anyway. So I, I, don't, I don't know how to fix that. I'm done, that's all. Can I interject something? Just because I'm a trustee, so I, I kind of get it. Back to yeah. Oh. yeah. I mean, I know, for us as a trustee, aren't my name and phone number, all that stuff is registered with the city? Couldn't you just put a policy in place where if you are a registered trustee, you have to opt in if the city's contacting you about something? I mean, that, to me, that Ashboard thing is like a, I don't know if it's a safety thing, but you know, it's certainly yeah, an it's inconvenience a thing. So, you know, I, I get what you're saying, but I think you just right. say, if you are a trustee and you register with the city, this is what happens. You are going to be contacted by your council people in these form letters, that's how it works. The, the problem is the way we worded this, we're either required to have some sort of disclaimer, which I guess we could do anyway, or I'm not even clear if we are prohibited. I don't I don't understand. Are we prohibited the way this is worded? The way it's worded is if you have an email or a successive emails that goes to and we reduce the number to twenty five based right. on a suggestion and again that's right, I'm right. open to however you want to fix that. Um, that you send a email of substantially similar nature to more than 25 persons. Yes. That would consider a mass communication, which would require the person receiving it to subscribe for that email actively and willingly and with consent, and would have to include the language with the disclaimer. Which makes, which the language provided said, and I quote, to receive my newsletter. And that doesn't apply to this. It's not a newsletter. So we would need, we, if, if we're going to have to do this because we're going to make sure it is considered mass communication, then let's come up with a separate disclaimer that applies to those types of situations. Even if it's, you're, even if it's something like you're receiving this email because you have already consented and provided your email as a trustee, if you would like to be removed or are no longer a trustee, but but what this disclaimer does not fit that scenario, and that's a problem. Yeah, Councilmember Burley, no. Oh, are you done? Wait, I guess one oh, quick question. So if I send out these emails, they haven't already consented to quote that newsletter. So can can I go ahead and send them out this week? Or is it a problem because it's a mass communication? Just send multiple emails to 25, 44 people. <laughs> but the way, yeah, but the way this is written, it doesn't matter if it's multiple emails, distributed singly or in bulk. That's what I'm saying. So we should just change the language to emails. In bulk. Yeah. Bulk. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, what, what was the proposed? I would just change the language just to change it. The to change it to it, where it's, they're bulking those. Like if I'm sending 
25 individual emails that are similar, but they're individual, or if it's like, a, you know, for my subdivision, it would be to three people. Right, right. Okay, that's not a block of, tw like, I think it should be 25, you could probably make it where it's 25 on an email, I think. Or just make a trustee clause. Yeah, yeah maybe a trustee clause. Just make a trustee clause, and that, that makes sure because the only time you would ever do it would be trustees. Like right, because people take advantage. I, I like what you're saying, but some people will do, okay, I'm going to send to 400 people, but I'm going to make sure it's in groups of 24. Yeah, no, yeah. we don't, you know, no, don't want to. And we want to prohibit that, but yeah. we, we need to be able to use similar language letter to letter mm -hmm. and not exceed. Trustee clause gets that. Trustee, trustee clause. clause. Yes, Perfect. trustee clause. So they've opted in. I don't have to ask them to subscribe to the letter about ash borers, right? Yeah. We'll take care of that in a trustee clause. Sure. Perfect. Perfect. All right. All right. Now I've got Councilmember yeah. Burling, but time for John here. <clears throat> At this point, absent this policy, okay, rolling back as if if we did not have any of this discussion. Up to this point, anybody who said they wanted to receive the city newsletter, okay, and, and requested that, that email became uh, subject to Sunshine Law retrieval. Is that correct, John? Arguably, yes. Yes, okay. So, and we didn't have any prohibition on that at all. It was, you know, if, if we sent it in, if somebody sent it in, we didn't have the disclaimers. We didn't have anything, so somebody responded and said, I want to get the email, well, I want to get your city newsletter. We accepted that, and under Sunshine Law Records, that is a public record. Right? It's definitely public okay. record. Right. So I, I, I want to say that I, th given that, I think Niles did nothing wrong at all in requesting the Sunshine, uh, the request to have those emails sent to him. I, I think he acted properly in doing that, and that the absent any law or requirement or ordinance that we had, uh, Ryan rightfully sent them to it. I don't think anything was wrong with that. Okay? Um, I just want to go on record and say I, I, I believe that. Okay, um, But since we are now at the point saying, well, maybe we should put some parameters around that. And I still don't see in here, and I'm going back to what, what Dr. Leamy said about I really wanted this disclaimer portion, this subscribe email disclaimer thing to say very specifically that your email will not be shared with anyone or forwarded with to anyone except as pursuant to requirements under the Sunshine Law. And I don't hear that. I don't see that specific language in here. And uh, that that. I th going back to kind of, kind of uh, backing up uh, Ken's notion or idea there that we, I think we have specific language which says, no, that's not really a good idea for the council members to do that, okay? But we can still, under the Sunshine Law, we can still request it, we can get it, but as a general rule, it's not something we want to pursue, okay? The next thing I want to ask is, if I use my private email from my home, I can do anything I want. Is that correct? This policy does not address that. Doesn't address it, right? No. If I want to collect it, I do. I have you know hundreds of emails that I've collected from my constituents, and I communicate with my trustees all the time. I do it with my private through my private email, and none of this applies, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, and nobody can have access to those except me. And if I want to have a disclaimer on there, I can, but I don't. Okay. So anything I do on my private email is is just that it's private. Has nothing to do with this regulation. It's only when I use the city email um, form that I'm going to be subject to this policy, right? Correct. Okay, that was it. All right, and Council Member Evans. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. cool. Uh, so, did, did, I don't know that we adequately addressed this, but did we ever really come up with a concept that says the problem isn't requesting mass listservs, the problem is how you use them? Did, did we adequately address that? I don't, I don't think we did. Well, because what, what would keep me tomorrow from having email gate all over again and requesting a mass listserv? and then me using it. 
and just throw in a disclaimer on the bottom when technically they didn't subscribe to me. We, we never addressed how that email was used by a city official. We only addressed that, yes, it's legal to get them. That's a big glaring problem because we're going to go through this whole thing again, and I'd rather just not go through it again. But I thought that's, that's, what I was, that's what I was saying actually earlier was that under number five, under subscribed, because I disagree, Dave. I think, do they think it was a breach of consent when the process of acquiring these? But there was also the use of it that was the problem because it used it. The city email was used for lobbying, which was against actually the MEC rules. That's the problem that that's here. But we can move forward from this, I think. But number five is subscribed emails. Um, I, that's where I was saying we need to say that the citizens have to consent. So if we already have a current, they have to they have to to consent to check a box to say I'm consenting for this newsletter, and then they can have another box that says, I'm, consent, I'm providing my consent that my email can be referred to city council members for other purposes. I think that addresses what we're talking well, but about. What's, what's, what's keeping me from requesting that list and then sending that entire list served in my personal email? Well, th that's what I'm saying. I mean, you can do that with a Sunshine request. That's at this point, yep. you know, at this point, there's nothing that prohibit that. Correct? Nothing could prohibit that. Okay. You can't do oh, that. Oh boy. There wasn't a sunshine request that got the initial that led to all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, hang mm -hmm. on just a second. Just for so clarification. I want to make sure. Are you done? Because you had the floor. Sorry. No, no, that was a good dialogue. Oh, yeah, and, and just I think that uh, Dave clarified on on one of the things you said too is that. You know, there, there are emails that you can collect mm -hmm. during your campaign, and as long as you keep them completely separate and don't, you know, go the opposite direction from your city and then to your campaign, I think you're okay. They need to be separate, completely separate spheres of influence. So can, can I just ask you to answer that question real fast? Well, you're actually up next. So. Excellent, excellent timing. Um, so in regards to Ms. Eden's, what you just said, so then would we recommend that in the obtaining consent to be able to use subscribed emails for say a newsletter to say other official business should we separate from the disclaimer have the ability for folks to also consent for their emails to be used for by their city council members for non-official business no agree i just no. want to make sure that we no. make sure that no. we say that out loud yeah I don't think we should do that. No. I don't Absolutely. think so either. I don't agree with that method of transfer. So hang on. Uh, Councilman Murray, are you finished then with your comments? Yes, I'm done. Good. Right, yeah. I've got Councilman Beverly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John, to you, uh, what are the, the general requirements for a sunshine request? Um, is, it, is it as simple as, I just want to see the data? Or does it have to be, I have a specific legal issue that I'm pursuing, and in pursuit of that, I am entitled to these records. It's it's the first one. It is I would like to see or have a copy of X or a range of X. And the city is obligated to provide it unless it falls within one of the exceptions that's expressly provided in the statute. Do we pay for that? Do citizens pay for that though, correct? Yes. And have we generally and for city council members, because this is really where we're really worried about here. How, how, right, how, how city council members, are they able to obtain that information without paying for it? That has been the practice of the city since I've been here. So in this circumstance for emails, I don't think there should be a double standard. So we have an item that is um, not ready for we action, but it is receipt, so. a high priority item, elected and appointed officials paying for records requests, and it pertains to getting records from the city council or officer perspective. So that would be the intent of addressing it in that particular item. So uh Councilmember really I was done. Yeah, good. All right, Councilmember McCune, I've got you next. Okay, so this has been a great discussion. It's opened my eyes a little bit more and I just think I need more clarity. I think what we've we've put together, I think you did great, is that hindsight I could pay as a citizen to get the emails and I'll have a list. Mm -hmm. And if I want to take that list, because I'm a, I'm a resident at that point, I get all the emails, I can stick it in my personal email and go to town, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Whatever I want to do. Mm -hmm. 
So we're really not guarding anything, and I think that the complaints and what I had asked at council was I wanted to see the residents actually complaining and why they had such an issue to it. I never got that because that council member is no longer here for the allegations that were presented. I think that we had maybe five to seven people, and if you do that in a percent of what our population is, this is so minor, it's we're really beating something down. But I get what we're trying to carve out here, but we're really not trying to because it all stemmed from council member Stevens. That's where this started imploding. I agree with what council member Bergelino, I don't think that there was any wrongdoing at the time of when it was received. I see where you guys wanna to try to block that going forward so it doesn't happen again. But what this is saying, it's not bulletproof. There's a way around it. So why are we so worried about trying to put something together that's not going to block anything? There's a way around it. So that's where all this discussion, that's what my take is on this. So I think that we're, and correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, what is this really doing based on what I've just been told? And I guess I would ask the attorney that question. Is there anything that's really, really putting something solid down here that really blocks us or blocks whoever into what? I mean, there's a way around it with the Sunshine request. Am I right? Well, the intent of the policy as drafted and consistent with policies that are drafted elsewhere is to is the appropriate use of city resources mm -hmm. and that is the city email system mm -hmm. and that's what this policy is intended to foster it's appropriate use of city resources for official business so like i guess it goes back to you it really didn't address the initial concern that had popped up like what councilman borlino said is that this is how it's done we just kind of came into something different here. Oh. I think and we can make it address it. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, we can go through this topic, and I can point, point, sure, point, 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 go through every single point that there was a problem with transfer, use of third party. All of these things that are addressed, actually, in this would obviate those problems. With yeah. all due respect, with all due respect, I could, sure. fill, I could fill this room with my constituents who have a problem with what happened. But I don't have to provide that to sure. you as a council no. member. I understand, but I know you're asking for that and saying it's a minor problem. I would tell you it is not a minor problem. People actually were actually quite upset about this issue and they were concerned. You are absolutely right. Folks can put forth a sunshine request and get this information, but we are elected officials. Sure. That's where this is different. I think we actually have to behave differently. And within the confines, I think this is important for us moving forward because I think transfer to a third party or forwarding is a major issue. I think obtaining consent from the citizens specifically for why they sign up from something for the city for use by city email is important. City email can't be used for third party forwarding or used at all for campaign ballots like Better Together, even though it's a worthwhile uh, cause for us to be potentially part of against uh, the creation of Better Together. We can't do that. That's why this is important. We need this so that we are all going to be holding to the, just this policy. Okay. It doesn't change anything about like Dave, the, the, the council member, really, he could do this in his private email, no doubt. But this is under official email only. I'm not against it. I was yeah. just wanted, with, based on the conversation, I yeah. just kind of full circle going, yeah. okay, did we even really protect anything here? Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that there's some purpose to yeah. it, that I fully understand if I'm asked. Yeah. Well, if they can still get it, then what is the purpose here? And I didn't feel comfortable with answering that. So I, I see what you're saying. I'm not opposed to it. I just want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Uh, Council Member uh, Stevens. Uh, wait, did you finish? Okay, so Stevens. Um, <clears throat> as far as saying that, that, that the whole discussion started with me, that is not correct. I mean, okay. people have been form farming emails from the city for years, and it goes on not in this city, but other cities everywhere. You receive an email from a resident about an issue, you know, you can contact that resident again about whatever you want, okay? They, they emailed you, they want to get in touch with you. You should be able to respond to them, whether it's as a candidate or as a council member, you know? So that's just, I mean, that happens everywhere. So to say that it started with me, incorrect um the third party versus a non-third party john is that still 
sunshineable, right? Like, so if I sent an email to 25 people, to 50 people, to 100 people, whether I sent it just by myself or I sent it through a third party email, it's sunshine law still applies either way, right? Not necessarily. One, it has to be a record that is retained by the city. If you send it through a third party, it's not retained by the city. And it's sent out from my city of Wildwood email address that goes to all these people, that's, they can, they, people can ask what emails am I sending out, right? So you could make a request to get all my emails for the last month. Does it really matter if I send it third party or not third party? You're still gonna get the emails, right? Again, it, it depends on how the third party operates. If you just enter an address as being the sender, as opposed to actually using right. the city server, so your actual email address, it will not be retained by the city, which means it is not a public record. Mm -hmm. You're scared. Yeah, that's true. So it has to be physically retained by the city, either by the city clerk or on a city computer system. Okay. All right. Um, and to say you could fill a room with people that didn't like the email, I could fill 10 rooms with people that agreed with the email about the merger. So I don't think the content was the problem. I don't think that it started with me. And I, again, I, I, don't, I kind of agree. I don't think it solves anything. I did have one other question on the email forwarding. So if I got an email back from Sam about, and it, like I had a resident contact me about something. He emails me back, this is the answer. You're saying that we cannot forward that to the resident that had the question to begin with? Well, that's a recommendation that I got. I guess I would ask for clarification on that as well, and how the committee would like to deal with that. I, I kind of interpreted that, but I don't think I expressed it very well as more of a, we used to call it pop accounts, where you would get, you know, it would automatically transfer it to a third party. I think that's what the intent, and I don't think I explained that well. I think I need to revise To that. Gmail, Yahoo, or some exactly. third party like MailChimp. So it's, not, it's not council member forwarding an email from the city administrator to a resident in response to a question. I believe it's intended that when you receive your email, are you reading it on your Gmail account? I think that's what's intended, and I would clarify that. Okay, and then what a, and on the forwarding as well, then. So can I forward information to my own personal account? Can I just to keep my own records of it? I think the intent is that you would keep it on your city account. Um, now, and again, I, I guess I would ask for the clarification if it's a, if you have to manually go in and forward or if it's an automatic forward. I, I, so I'll leave that to the committee on how they want to handle that. Like my personal account's easier to search and I'm just more comfortable with it. And I know a lot of times the emails in the city server, they don't necessarily get lost, but they get shuffled down. Whereas my Yahoo account's very easy and I'm much more user friendly for me to search up information. So under this proposal or change or policy, would it be okay for me to forward information to my personal account just so it's easier for me to find. Well, again, my my understanding, and again, I didn't describe it well, was an automatic transfer, but I think I understand it. But that's up to the committee. So it's something where you can't set it up to automatically send it. Gotcha. Okay. That's what I understood. In, in regards to that then, so just to clarify this, if it's okay, if you, if I, if I forward something currently from my city council email to my Gmail account, delete it from my city council uh, email, um, how long do we maintain those records that may be deleted? Well, because this is the crux of the issue that I think most people would worry about is that Gmail won't be subject to sunshine. Correct. That's the issue. That's why that's the tenor of why the there's, forwarding is there's an issue. records retention. Yeah. Uh, and I believe Councilman Bertolino back a while back we had talked about modeling it after I believe state. Well, the, the state record retention policies require, there's three different types of communications yeah. and it depends on content yeah. of the communication. Now, uh, my understanding right now is the city is not regularly deleting uh, email correspondence. So at this point, they're being retained pretty regularly, indefinitely. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that 
getting into a system of, and I believe we've been talking at the administrative level about getting into a more of a system of routine deletion, because mm -hmm. uh, it's just appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, but regular, there's three different types of, of communications. Transitory requiring no retention. Mm -hmm. uh, there's general communication, which requires one year. And then there's policy communication, which requires permanent. So anything that is of substance in terms of communication is going to be required to be retained indefinitely, permanently anyway. And who's making that distinction? The city clerk. Okay, and routinely. That, that is what their policy says. Okay. Council Member Eden, I have you up. Yep, do we need um, just a general statement line about deletion, <coughs> piggybacking, for example, you know, we get advertisements, we get spam, Apple sends us, please buy our laptop ads, there's I can't imagine anything wrong with deleting the please buy my laptop ad. I mean, do we need to explicitly list that in here or just leave that alone? We have a records retention policy that addresses that. So that's a slightly different issue. And frankly, if you delete it, it's still retained on the city system. Okay, so I'm so just deleting it off my iPad. So whether you delete it off okay. your desktop or not. Mm -hmm. So I can, I can do that. And then my other comment was, I understand what uh, Niles was saying. Um, Yes, I think if it is a, a email that you, especially a working email, you can forward it to yourself. It's appropriate, create a draft and then email it back to the city. Um, I know I had asked you about that before. We had a 98 page document to type on and review for the historic preservation um, committee. And I don't, have a, I don't have a word in a PDF program on my iPad. And I don't have city email on my phone. I don't have city email on my laptop. I had to email it to myself type on it and email it back to the city. And that, there ha that is completely different than transferring it to a third party where there's no record of it. I, I don't disagree with you, but I think the careful question in this policy though is, if I forward something from my city email to my private email, which is, I understand that's not, that's okay, but does that, afford us the ability without going through sunshine to retain email records from those people to now start sending things from my Gmail account if it was started at the beginning with just using city it's not like they contact so you're not me. talking about sending it back to yourself you're talking about sending it to other people then from, from, from your Gmail mm -hmm. that's okay. the careful question email addresses and using them for something else correct so maybe the question for John is should you be conducting official business from a non-city email or resource. Or retaining public record without going through the process of obtaining it or through the process of when you get the information from. It would be okay if I contacted you through my private account. There has to be that clause in there that allows that transfer to occur because otherwise then you're taking it without going through the process. But, but Quick question. Yep. Okay, so if a resident asks us to send information, we can send it from our city email right. and they will have a copy of it. Is it also not doing the same thing if we email it to ourselves? We're also citizens too. Yeah. If I want a copy of that. Yeah, that's not what he's talking about. No. I know. I just want to make sure yep. that I, I think I'm having a different conversation than you and I'm a little yeah. confused about what you're you saying. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I agree that there are emails that get lost and it's helpful to forward them to yourself for sure. your own records retention. What, what Ken's saying, I think, if I may, right. please, is let's say I set up this iPad to every time I'm interacting with my city email, it's on this iPad, but every email I send gets forwarded to my personal account. Then I can go into that personal account, take every email address and do whatever I want with it. Right. right. Even though those people had nothing to do with wanting to do that. I can set this thing up to do that. I shouldn't. Got it. That's a different. I mean, it's okay. You know, Dave. Dave acquires these, and you know, and sends them his Gmail because you know, hi, I met you. Do you mind if I have your email address? Can I, you know, contact you? That's different. This is a transfer, and then utilization of the transfer right. without going through the standard public record acquisition process. Okay. Is that answer, Mr. The more we talk. Um, the, the more I'm convinced that what we're really talking about is not policy of emails or memos, it's about ethics. Mm -hmm. It's about conduct of us as, as elected officials. Uh, and maybe we should 
kind of step back and rethink what we really should be talking about, and that is a, you know, sort of a communications ethics statements that the council, if presented to the council, they would review, gnaw on, come up to conclusions, and we would kind of like sign off on, this is how we're going to behave going forward, as opposed to trying to write, you know, unloopholed <laughs> policy mm -hmm. that does the same thing. So I, I throw that out as an option. Don't you think, though, that this at least gives some framework, though, for, for at least policy, but we can still have an ethics conversation separate from that? Because this is pretty clear on a lot of things, actually. I mean, I, I don't know. John, do you think, what are your thoughts with some minor fixing of this, perhaps? Well, I, I think there is, I think we are kind of, diverging from mm -hmm. what the policy is and getting into the ethical questions and truly it comes down to uh, and I was actually just looking at the code of ethics because I had it I had a provision that might be even applicable to the circumstances about using uh, information received in your official capacity for personal purposes um, and whether that's appropriate. Uh, I know there's some financial considerations mm -hmm. um, but I do think to Councilmember Bertolino's point that that may be an ethics mm -hmm. issue as opposed to an email policy issue. Sure. Because remember, as far as the email policy too is, you know, what's what's the punishment if you violate it? That's it's, by we take away your mm -hmm. city email yeah. and everything's going to be done in private email <laughs> anyway. So yeah. it might be even counterproductive <laughs> to a certain extent uh, to have those type of ethical provisions. Okay. Right. So at this point, right now. Uh, the question out there, you know, if we want to you know, continue, uh, you know, based on some of the feedback, continue this discussion for the next one, and then at that time, see if we can send something at the same time, see if we can look into the ethics uh, code, uh, if that's, if it covers it there, but my understanding is really good that the code of ethics always had a financial aspect to it there. Well, and then we do cite in the purpose clause the provision of the code of ordinance that says employees and officials shall not use city owned vehicles, equipment, materials, or property for personal convenience or profit. Um, now, when you receive email addresses and email lists, does that fall in that category? Arguably, but I, I'm not sure there's a factual circumstance of where that falls and how it's used. Okay, just real quickly, I, I'm trying to remember from a couple council meetings ago, it was the question was asked whether or not we could have you explore as a city attorney whether or not redacting of a portion of the emails would be appropriate with Sunshine Law, even if it was, you know, deleting two letters and still having that person's name. So that privacy was protected, but it was also transparent. I believe at the time what the committee did was they decided we decided it was a separate discussion and we kicked the can down the road and didn't direct you to do that because that was a billable hour. Was that is that correct? Mm -hmm. Because because if we're doing email policy, then and if redaction is possible, I would like it to be a part of the policy. So if you if you haven't done the research, I would like to ask the committee to make to make that direction directive. I just don't have, I don't have all of the information at my fingertips because I think it's exactly what Crystal was saying is we're, we're, we're trying to protect something and there's more than way, one way that it can unravel. So is there a way to stop it from unraveling that you can tell us with your legal research? Do you need a motion? Uh, I would prefer that given the controversial nature of the topic. Yes, I please. would like to make the motion for you to explore through court case history. Um, not the research, right. research um, what actions we can take to to um, balance privacy rights with transparency, the privacy rights of our citizens with transparency of government, including but not limited to redacting emails. Do you know how many hours that's going to take? You think? That was what the controversy was about. Yeah, and it's 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 difficult to say. I know where my starting point's going to be, so that's a positive. I would say it would be less than ten hours to do a full research on that. I think it's worth it. Motion on the floor. <coughs> Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Bertolino. 
So we have a motion on the floor. Um, any discussion on the motion? Done? All right. Um, your comment, your hand was up before the motion. So I'm assuming what, What's the motion again? I'm sorry. I also, I'll, yeah. It you pertains to the, the redacting of uh, email addresses. Right. Uh, and, it, and it's not just because we, we've just discussed how anybody can request a list that includes advertising companies, you know, people with nefarious intentions that would want to sell that to marketing groups or council members or regular citizens. So I actually did get a lot of complaints. People felt like their, their privacy was violated by the city. So I want to know what my options are so that then we can make effective. So it's, it's just exploring options for protecting data while balancing that with transparency and sunshine law compliance. That's all the motion is. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I just can't hear a lot of discussion on how to stop communications with the public, so it's, just, it's, it's odd. If somebody had a complaint, you just tell them, yeah, if you email the city, it's it's public record and anybody can get it. They didn't there. email the city. Done. They subscribed to the newsletter. If they communicate with the city, it's public record. And you just let people know that up front and then they can decide whether or not they want to communicate with any government, whether it's the city of Wildwood or anyone else. Does this, does this stop at emails? So if I get an email from a resident can I walk over to their house and talk to them about campaign or anything else? I'm using my city resources that are paid for by the government, and I got a contact now. Can I just walk over there? I mean, we're trying to stop me from emailing. I understand that. But what's to stop me from using my city resources and using my email just to walk over and say hello and ask them for a vote? Stuff that didn't have them approved. Exactly. It's so, not relevant to the motion on the floor. Well, it's relevant as you know, you're 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 asking for for twenty eight hundred dollars worth of research for so we something got a point that of order and it's specific to doesn't the solve the problem. So, um, all right, all those in favor of the motion, are you all clear? Aye. aye. All those aye. in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. One opposed. Any abstain? Okay, the motion passes. So we've got that down. So now that we make that motion. Um, looks like you've got some additional work to do for us. Um, I think at this point there's no action to be taken to move this yet to council. I think we'll okay. like come back to that okay. research. Um, so if there isn't any objection, I think we can proceed. And that I, I do make the best use of our time. It is 9.01. Uh, I want to check uh, with the committee on the remaining items that we have here on the agenda. Um, you know, following practice that uh, Councilmember McCutcheon does in planning in parts. So I think it's a good opportunity just to check to see so that we can leverage uh, our time wisely for any of the time sensitive items. So uh, let me quickly run through here. Number four, this uh, item here, review of the candidate queuing procedures. Uh, there's uh, one portion of it that we request from Councilmember McCutcheon with regards to looking at the policy of queuing up uh, how people queue up outside and I think also how the, the queuing is of that day prior to the opening of filing sitting in the room all day. Um, she thought there might be some better ways to address it. At the same time, the city administrator made us aware that there is uh, a partnership agreement opportunity with St. Louis County where um, they would facilitate the whole process of filing um, so it would be, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it'd be out of the hands of the city. So you would have to file in St. Anne um, with the county. And they also have a different way of how you end up on the ballot. It's a lottery system on the first day. So um, if we were to discuss and feel that the county approach was something we wanted to do, it does have to be uh, approved by the council prior to a November date. And um, so, so that, you know, I, we may want to get that. Then uh, as far as remaining items of the public works, we have an acceptance of streets for a while with trail subdivision. I'm not aware of any objections to that. Um, and then we have one more item, which is a contract supplement with Gamma Tree Service for the planting of additional trees under the 2019 tree planting contract, which I'm sure you probably want to get that one done too, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, either we can try to knock these three out or if you feel like, you know, as we get into it, you know, we'll do that. Council Member Burley. If I may, um, I, I would move that we move the um, 
election day uh, provisions to our next meeting. And anything that we would enact, I think, would have to be for next, not this coming election. We're, we're right up against the, the beginning of petitions and so on. So I think it, it, it we got time to work yeah. on this one. So I would say well, let's move that one to the next meeting. I think uh, that is a valid point because that information that the city administrator can fill us in, that's probably being drafted up right now. And usually that process starts right at the end of this month. So I think you're right on point. The only thing would be is if we're interested with the county to do that. Um, it's not mandatory, I believe. It's an option. So uh, let's, let's just discuss that item briefly. If you're interested in pursuing this option with the county or if you feel the city well, that you continue to manage it here. Um, Council Member Remy. Um, I'm okay with not doing the county. I'm okay with sticking with what we currently do. But the only caveat I would say is, and obviously, of, of all people, I'm the one saying this, obviously. Um, section 105.0040, I would explore it even for this campaign season for number C, or letter C, excuse me, um, where it says at the very end, it shall be just subscribed and sworn to by the candidate before an elected official authorized to accept his or her declaration of that candidacy. Since our city clerks are all notaries, I think that we should just have the city clerks notarize everybody's ballot uh, petitions and not have any outside notaries be used. So, um, just make it across the board, everybody. When you present your, you, when you present your petitions, you're signed uh, at the time of the day that you decide to do that. The city clerk uh, will uh, will notarize everyone's. Not, not you, know, you won't be going to UPS. I'll never do that uh, or other places. But that's the only thing I would submit for this campaign season. All right. So you you're throwing that out there. Let's quickly see if that's something that. Um, can be done, I don't know, from a legal perspective, do we cross the city resource campaign lines or? I'd, I'd have to confirm to see if that statutory language or not. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Because uh, he currently does, they do do it. They I would do, say. do it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, she did a, almost half of everybody that ran last year. So. I know UPS does. I know, I do, <laughs> I do too. I was there 10 minutes before I got here. So, <laughs> Sam, do you have any <laughs> thoughts on that? Um, I'm just learning about the process yeah. that, uh, that we use, and I know for just for protection purposes, our city clerk will sign the the form that says we receive the candidate's information. We have another city employee actually notarize. Right, you do. Right, that's right. We, we don't have the city clerk do both. Correct. And there's probably nothing that prevents us from doing that. Yeah. But wants to keep Yeah. No. No. That's that's what I'm saying. Is so on that topic, uh, I think, yeah, on that topic, uh, two things can. One is, um, I don't think we make any changes for this okay. this year. Sure. I, I just think it's too it's too late. Uh, we're going to have people out getting petitions starting probably the first of November. So I'd say it's too late to do anything this year. Uh, secondarily, I don't want the county involved. No. I, this is this is local. This Agreed. is us. Uh, if, I, if you told me I had to go down to St. Anne's get my petitions, I'd say, come on, yeah. you know, I I agree. Not, that's, uh, let's do it here. Agree, I'm sure Council Member Greg Manning is saying, you know, keep our distance from the county. Yeah, let's, let's, let's not. It, but you mentioned something in their process that I really want to discuss here, and that is sitting out in the cold at four in the morning hoping yeah. you're the first guy in line is not a way for adults to behave. So. Let's find a different way so, to get that. So that is an option. And um, <coughs> uh, one quick thing, though, uh, notary, uh, the paperwork, mm -hmm. it's really notarizing who collected the signatures. Correct. And so exactly. that could also be potential people that may have gotten signatures on behalf of a candidate. So you know, if, if you were to get Correct. signatures from me, it should be notarizing that you uh, were the one. And the notary, all the notary is saying is this, yes, this, I'm watching this person sign, and that's all I'm, that's all I'm notarizing. It isn't. And you're attesting that you're, you're testing that, that I'm that person, so I, that's that's yeah. a sticky one. Yeah. I, I, all it, yeah, and I, I know this better than anyone because I've I know this better than anyone. I promise you this. All it's saying is that it's no, it's it's saying that I have agreed that the people that are signing it signed before me. It's yes. not actually that's right. Sub notarizing the person signing your paper. Uh, I'm that's where mistaken. everyone makes that mistake. Yeah. So if you watched your person, like your wife, what I've got. Thing, and you watched her sign, you could bring that in and say, I saw her sign this, then the person would notarize it? No. So um, 
so there's two things here. So believe it or not, I, I didn't do this, but if you're within the 45 day period, you could actually get the notary before the signatures happened. We did have that discussion. Correct. You could do that. That's actually within the actual law of the elect because it's still notarizing that you're the one saying that these are signatures that were um, that were given to you in your presence. My wife could not go get those signatures for me and me get that notarized then. It's me as the candidate before. My wife can't go get the signatures. It has to be me as the candidate. Wait, you lost me. I think you mentioned my wife can't go out and get 25 signatures from me and then me go get it notarized. She would have to get it notarized. She can't. She have to it's got to be the candidate. You can't have another person for running for a campaign get signatures for your campaign. You, you, oh, you can yeah. volunteer. Oh, yeah, you can volunteer. Get your oh, I'm, I'm sorry. So you can't, you'd have to get that person to present, have it notarized for, for if he, Joe decided to go get signatures, 25 signatures for me. The notarization actually has to be in his presence. Right. Okay, right. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, well, I can't get notarized for him. Yeah, but you, what I heard you say was, oh, yeah. excuse me. Yeah, yeah. sorry, yeah. that's where I think there was. That you, what, what, what you, I heard you say was that in advance of Joe going out and yeah. getting signatures. I could get it notarized. You could get it notarized. Correct. Right. But that notarization has to be with the notary present with Joe as he signs it? No. You can sign it because it's just you saying. I have no time for saying that he is going to do this. Okay. Which is why, I, uh, which is why, to make this really easy, that's why I was saying, just have it done by the notary at well, City when you I present. The challenge is, then you're, you're the, the challenge is if I get five people getting signatures, me, I've got to bring all five with me to get it notarized in front of the notary. That day. yeah, and that's and whether where I can do it in advance, that person will go get notary notarized, and therefore I bring the notarized form. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. So uh, next year, the uh, I think the um, uh, yeah, maybe let's Sorry. clear this one Percent. off the table. Are there any objections to the thought of keeping the filing within the city of St. Louis and not engaging in the county? I think Councilmember Berlino made it clear. Uh, continue that process as is. Um, so unless there's any objections, we can even discuss that. I think we can take that one off the table. So I think Councilmember Bertolino's point, it's a really good one. There's the topic of, you know, how, you know, is there a way to do it better than to have, you know, people go through a process of queuing up uh, out in the cold or also sitting through the room during the day. And I know that the county does this, um, and I believe the city of O'Fallon does this as well, but, and there may be other cities on the first, with the county's proposal, the one that we could consider, the county says that on your first day of filing, um, it doesn't matter whether you, you're the first person in or the last person that day, it's a lottery that's conducted at the end of the day and whoever comes first you know, in that lottery is the first person on the ballot and so forth. Um, I think they only specify the first day. Uh, I'm assuming that maybe then subsequent days it's more of just who shows up so that could be one option. Um, I don't know, um, city attorney, if you have heard, or you know, maybe city administrator, you've seen other methods that we would want to consider. But I know to Councilwoman McCutcheon couldn't be here. She thought it was very uh, ineffective that people sit here the whole day, um, you know, from eight to five, waiting for the filing the next day. Are you looking for someone to make a motion for this cycle, or are we going to? Because I would make, I'm, I'm going to make a motion that we should evaluate our current um, election process the first uh, in, in the meeting in April, which is before a new council takes over, but still will reflect actually the current practice. From a timing perspective, I think it does present some challenges because if this count, if this committee were to approve a process, we would have to send it to council, and that means will it, they be ready to be for this coming Monday? And then you're going to need probably two readings. If I'm, am I going wrong? Well, I think we should rush it. Uh, just to raise a point of information, the charter does specify that the list of the ballots is based on order of receipt. Order of receipt. So we couldn't go with the lottery system. So then that conflicts with the county's proposal. We couldn't even sign up with that. 
Yeah, that's cable is So then, uh, maybe then the only thing is, is there a way to change the queuing process before filing? Is it maybe whoever signs at 8 a.m. staying on that list and then that, as long as they're here the next day on Tuesday, they will preserve their order on the list versus so signing at the end of the day. Why not for 8 a.m. signing? That means they would still, they could still queue up. They could still show up at 4 in the morning and, and do that. And I don't know that there's any anything that can stop people from doing that. I know people who have waited here um, from 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon. So, just to, I, I, I don't know that this is a real issue. Um, I mean, folks that maybe signed up for the ballot last year, they lost. Right. So, um, I, I don't think we need to change I, anything right now. Well, again, the, I think the timing puts a lot of pressure because I would believe that the city clerk, when the, the announcement of the process goes out, which should be done in advance of the end of October, we would probably be cutting it very close to try to change something. So the timing is probably not in our favor. Right. That's what I'm saying. I hate to change it after that is already published. Right. All right, so therefore we will revisit this um, for future. So let's move, we'll, we'll move on. Is that agreed? Yeah. Any okay. objections? I say put it on your April ballot, or your April meeting. We'll put it on our April agenda yeah. list. Okay. Thank you. All right, so the next item, uh, we have public works for action item. It's an acceptance of streets for the Wildwood Trail subdivision. Rick. Um, yes, council member, just as a fairly basic request. Um, mm -hmm. While the trail subdivision is complete, the homes are hunched and occupied and the streets have been repaired and escalates have been released. So from the department's perspective, uh, we need to get the streets over officially and for maintenance and for snow removal. And with winter approaching, we'd like to get that process done. So that's the recommendation. It's so moved. Yeah. Okay, motion made by Council Member Bertolino, seconded by Council Member Farmer. Okay, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstain, that passes. All right, we have one more for action item. Number two, the contract supplement with Gamut Tree Service for planting of additional trees under the 2019 tree planting contract. All right. Thank you, Chair. Council members, this is a, another fairly simple request. Um, as you know, earlier in the year, we had a tree planting project. We publicly bid that contract with Gamma. Um, last January, as a result of that bid, we have a very favorable unit price to plant trees. And as what as typically happens throughout the year, we get requests from residents to replant trees that have died on the front of their homes, street trees that have died. So we'd like to take advantage of that unit price, which is $218.75 per tree. And what we're doing is requesting authorization to uh, essentially issue a change order with Gamma for 25 more trees at 218.75 per tree. The total cost uh, would be $5,168.75. So that's the request uh, of the committee. If you agree to that tonight, we'll take it to the city council next week. Can, can I ask a question? Sure. It'll be um, super quick. Uh, can that extend in subdivisions or is that just with the city? Well, you can certainly inquire um, with Gamma and, and with Gamma to see if they would consider for, for planting on like common ground or private Yeah, I mean, property. like, you know, I've got a bunch of, we've got a bunch of trees that run down Thunderhead Canyon that are dead. So you're talking about on a city street? On a city. On a city street. But it's not in the right of way. It's in the, it's oh. on a city street, but in, you know, on the so other side of the side. Yeah, gotcha. right. So that's a common ground. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have the city pay for it, but if, if you know, I know I'm not the only, we've got a bunch of yeah. them around us, other subdivisions, the same kind of a thing. So if we can maybe have that extended out, that would be cool. I'm okay with you guys I doing think, it. I think that might be just a question offline to yeah. ask if they are willing to extend that, but I think this is specific yeah. to the city, you know. I think if there's in similar locations that are easy to get to, they might honor that price. You can certainly right. ask if we can get you in contact with their frequency. Uh, so move that we adopt the recommendation. A motion by Councilmember Berlino, seconded by Councilmember Farmer. So, Councilmember Reddy, we have a motion yep. to approve the recommendation the regarding the trees. Uh, so, Councilmember Berlino. Yeah, uh, to the point, um, over the weekend or so, I, I shot off a text to uh, 
or actually a voicemail to Julian, uh, sitting on Sunday thinking, you know, we've, we've got, by, by best estimate we've sold before, 1,300 or so um, ash trees that are going to go down the tubes over the next few years if we don't do something and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And what I was thinking about, why don't we engage the whole community through our business associations and so on to say, while it was all about trees, we've got a problem, okay? The most economical approach to this is replacing those trees as they begin to die. That's going to cost $218 a tree or whatever it is, a replacement cost. Why not get the whole community involved in the tree purchasing process? Okay, we're looking at budget restraints as it is going forward. Um, why not engage the whole community? Because we hear a lot about protect the trees, you know, don't pull down and stuff. Here's a chance to go back and say, this is something nature's taken over. We can't do much about it, but we certainly can replace these trees. You want to pitch in and help. I'm just going to throw it out. Don't, no discussion. I'm just saying I gave it to Julian to think about. If it comes back, that's where it came from. And you threw it out there. No discussion. <laughs> Heard Council Member Bertolino. But good point. Uh, good good uh, suggestion there. Anything else? I know Council Member Eden's mentioned we may be running into some other tree issues. Right. I, I did find a great podcast and an NPR article. Um, I know that as you guys are determining what's most cost effective is there is an issue on the East Coast with the Chinese lantern fly, I believe, um, and they're expecting it to shift towards the Midwest. And um, so as we're thinking about budgeting, we probably need to think down the line of what other invasive species are we going to be hit with and will that affect long-term ash tree treatment when we are going to have some other ecological disaster with the price tag coming to. So I'm going to send out that article to you guys and you can listen to the podcast. Good. All right, so did everybody, uh, Carla, do you have a motion uh, on the floor, I think by Council Member Early and Old Farmer. So all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any opposed? I'm standing. Um, I think my article never got sent out to the, to the committee from last meeting. From the last meeting? Yes. Mm -hmm. You weren't here for it, I don't think. Yeah. What was it? It was an article about the cost effectiveness uh, strategies related to the different strategies that were proposed. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, based on the votes, uh, the motion does pass. So that will go to council. Thank you, Rick. Um, we have obviously some items not ready for action at this point right here. Um, so the next meeting is uh, October 29th. So anything uh, before we move on to the meeting? How about a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn by Councilmember Remy, second by Councilmember Farmer. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Say motion, uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you. So my, my correct the word, we do not have a November meeting. Right? So, so twice yeah, this October. is where we get into a slightly different schedule because the budgeting process. So that's something that we'll be discussing. But I'm correct. There's no, there, we're not being at 